perfection I've been chasing. Can I go deeper this time? When I'm throwing in the towel, scared I'm gonna drown. I pull my body up to the sky. If I'm still not my demons, I'm still not the inside. Baby, you are fearless. Sing it out loud. Foot in the water, don't rein it in. How long have I been in denial? Is it too late to begin? Rather fight than surrender or waste my time. Better to lose to myself than spend my life wondering why. If I'm staring at my demons, I'm staring at the answer. And I'm gonna be fearless, shout it out loud, starting with a whisper. I wanna sing out, sing it loud, 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 oh, loud, 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 oh, 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 There's something in the air, a whisper in my ear, and I can't get it out of my mind. Maybe these butterflies are trying to tell us there's something here that we need to find. And I don't know what love is up to these days, but it sure seems like it's hanging around, so won't you say you'll say even though we don't know what this is all about guess we'll just have to wait what we are we will eventually figure out all i know is that i want to be next to you and right now there's no room for the world so won't you stay Please say you'll stay
Oh God, it's the winter. I'm a winner in the summer. I'm a nothing feeling nothing. My head is freezing cold. She says it's seasonal. Why don't I believe it though? I'm only cold when it's colder. She wants to set me on fire. I won't be this numb, numb for the rest of my life. It's only lonely weather, it melts with the eye. Just give it some time, some time, some time, some time. So go and grab your sweater, the one that you like. And give it some time, some time, some time, some time. Feet up in the clouds, flowers in the rain. Weather's clearing up, why the hell does it look the same? I'm a nothing feeling nothing. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Collaborations Empowered 2021 Conference. So excited to have you all here. My name is Minji Chang. I am on the board of directors of Collaboration. I'm the former executive director. And today is going to be a good day, guys. Thank you guys so much for joining us bright and early Saturday morning if you are on the West Coast. And a little bit in the early afternoon if you're on the East Coast and wherever else you are in the world. We'd love to know where you're uh, tuning in from. So we're going to be active today. Y'all can chime in in the chat. Uh, first question of the day is like where you're watching and where you're live streaming this from. So feel free to pop that in. Um, but we're so excited to have you here. This is our second virtual conference. A um, little bit of background on collaboration. We're a nonprofit organization and we're a grassroots movement. And we have been around for 21 years to discover, connect, and elevate Asian American Pacific Islander artists. And uh, we started with our showcases and we've been performing all over North America for the last 21 years. We've had over 1,500 Asian American uh, artists perform on our stages. And in the last seven years, we started the Empower Conference, which was to educate and inspire those who are aspiring for creative professions. And that means in front of and behind the camera. 
So it's been a really exciting ride. We've had some amazing speakers, some incredible keynotes, uh, workshops. People have connected. They've gotten inspired to create their um, project into real life. And that's what we want to inspire with you guys today. So today is a day of action. It's a day of inspiration and it's a day of community because, uh, yeah, not to start off anything on a negative note, but we have to acknowledge that this has been a very tough year for the Asian American community. And in light of that, we want to come back even stronger and create a space for all of us to uplift each other and to be together and united and to bring in our allies, our friends, and just celebrate who we are and share that with the world. So uh, before we get into the conference, I wanted to ask everybody to please follow Collaboration on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, it's at Collaboration with a K. And if you are tuning in, we'd love to see where you're tuning in from. We saw some really amazing Insta stories and posts last year uh, tagging us from where you are in your virtual space. So you can use the hashtag empowered, uh, E-M-P-O-W-E-R-D. 2021 and we would love to share and see where you guys are tuning in from so please tag us and share the hashtag we'd love to uh, let the world know what, what's going on today and to talk with all of you guys because it's gonna be really really fun so before we dive into our first keynote it's gonna be great uh we have an announcement because we actually shared that in the in the last couple months but we had a leadership change here at collaboration i want to thank jane kim she stepped in as our executive director last fall uh, helped us get through our 20th anniversary celebration, which was amazing. And now, actually, we've had a switch, and we are welcoming back PK, Paul PK Kim, who is our founder, as our interim executive director. So we're going to kick off Empowered with a little message from him. Hey, everyone. This is PK. I hope you have a wonderful collaboration Empowered conference. I wish I could be with you all, but I have to MC a wedding today. And uh, I've been doing hundreds of them. That's why I miss so many collaboration events because I have to help feed these guys. I can't even point. See these guys right here, these munchkins? They eat nonstop and they cause a mess. If you have kids, like you could keep the house clean and then like an hour later, they make the whole place a jungle and you're like Jerry Maguire and you're like Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire. You're like, help me, help you, please. Anyways, I have to uh, be at a wedding and um, I know that Minji, Christine, Marvin, the entire Collaborative staff has worked hard to uh, provide this conference for inspiration, education, and for empowerment through entertainment. A big part of collaboration is leadership training and we all know more than ever, we need the AAPI community to come together. So thank you for being here and let's all uh, just come together and learn, grow, and collaborate, unite uh, during this time. I really wish I could be there with you, but I am setting up speaker equipment probably right now and uh, helping another couple come together and get married. And um, that's my life. <laughs> and uh, yeah, th this is another thing in my life. I've been cutting my own hair during the pandemic. And uh, this is why I started here and I kept messing up. And now pretty soon I'm just gonna shave it off. but. Hey, have a great conference, everybody, and uh, love you all. Thank you, Minji, Christine. Have a great conference. Bye. Thank you, PK. That was awesome. Uh, PK and I actually got to co-host the 20th anniversary show together in, in December. I have no sense of time. Um, and that was really incredible because PK is the reason why I joined Collaboration so many years ago, 12 years ago, actually. And uh, he's been an inspiration to me. So thank you, PK. We love you so much. And we're so glad that you're back and uh, excited for where Collaboration is going to go from here. It's a really exciting time. And so today we're going to kick things off with a really special message from somebody that I truly admire. A lot of us admire. She's been such an amazing spokesperson and leader and um, just a force within the entertainment community for the rest of society, honestly, as a journalist, um, talking about the award-winning journalist, Lisa Ling. Uh, she's the host and executive producer of the CNN original series, This Is Life with Lisa Ling. She has covered so many topics, hitting on some of the most important cultural changes and shifts and expansions in modern day. And we're very, very lucky for her to share a few words of welcoming and encouragement to everybody tuning in for Empower 2021. So without further ado, here is Lisa Ling. Hello, Collaboration. Thank you so much for inviting me to be one of your speakers at your Empowered Conference. I am so, so honored. 
I am currently in Oakland, California, working on an episode of my show about all of the hate-related incidents and crimes that are being perpetrated uh, against Asians in Asian communities here in the Bay Area and throughout the country. And I've had a couple of really hard days here. In fact, <laughs> it's been a really hard year for a lot of us. And this morning, um, before I left to start my day, um, by the way, there was a woman attacked in Oakland's Chinatown, five minutes away from where we were. But before I started the day, I watched the new video um, to MC Jin and Wyclef's new song, Stop the Hatred. And it was so, so powerful and really fueled me to get through this day. It just became this mantra in my head and it continued to percolate in my consciousness. And it really speaks to the, the power and the impact that music uh, and, and art and culture can have during the darkest times. And so I know that for many of you, your parents may not be entirely thrilled that you are pursuing your musical or your artistic ambitions, but just know that um, this can have such an impact um, for future generations. You know, we are on the one hand in this fight, right? We're in a fight for recognition. We're in a fight um, to not be invisible. We're in a fight to remind people that we belong here. And one day we are going to be able to tell our kids and their kids about this moment when we all stood up and we spoke out and we, we stood together with our arms locked uh, and we condemned the things that are happening to our community. And there will be anthems that go along with this fight. And so I encourage you all, I applaud you all for continuing to pursue your passion. We need this. Music can just have the most powerful diplomatic impact. There's nothing like music and, and art uh, that allows us to calm our nerves, to reduce tensions, to even bridge cultural divides. And I really can't think of anything that we need more to be able to do than those things. Um, and I, I can't wait to hear the anthems that will um, be paired with this fight that our kids and our grandkids are going to be reading about one day. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, already moved. Good way to kick off the day, right? Um, so a little bit, a tiny bit more background on collaboration. You know, we've had so many different types of performing artists perform on our stages and we've had comedians, we've had dancers, we have singer songwriters, MCs, and a lot of these folks have moved on to become incredible forces in the media and entertainment space. And it's just incredible because that career path is not an easy one. It's not something that we know has been widely encouraged for anybody, but especially for the Asian American community where um, we had a different existence here, uh, at least in the United States and within this industry. And that's been changing drastically. And collaboration is very proud to have been any sort of influence in that in, t in terms of encouraging folks to break through, break out of their comfort zones, to have hard conversations with themselves, with their parents, with their families and friends and loved ones. It's not an easy thing to do. So we just want to say that at the top, that this has been a part of our mission, a part of our fabric of existence. And we are just really excited to have everybody tuning in here to plant a seed and to hopefully create a gateway, a bridge for you to get closer to getting your project, your idea out into the world. Because as Lisa said, these stories are very, very impactful. These are the reference points that we will see in terms of history. They are the ways that we'll understand who we are and see our reflections reflected back to us and to share that with other people so that they can see the humanity in us. So we're very, very happy. Um, to share all these conversations. I hope you guys are just ready because there's a lot coming today. We've worked very hard and um, we're very excited to share all that with you. So to get into our first fireside chat, 
uh, we have somebody from one of our sponsors, Nielsen, who has been collecting data for many, many years, um, understanding the consumer. And they've done a lot of this data work that honestly, I don't think a lot of our generations have appreciated as much, maybe so much as our generations now in understanding the importance of data and how much that shapes uh, how businesses, how products, how content gets shared with the world, how it gets consumed, and what that does to shape the way that we experience life. So I'm really excited to introduce our speaker, Pat. Pat Patricia Ratulangi is the VP of Global Communications at Nielsen, and she is just an incredible force. We're so excited to learn some stuff from her today that is going to be influencing all the work that we are going to going to be doing, whether that's working in front or behind the camera or somewhere in between. Uh, and so with that, here's our fireside chat with VP of Global Communications at Nielsen, Patricia Radalangi. Hi, Pat. Welcome to the Empowered Creative Leadership Conference. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, hanging in there, Minji. Thank you so much for having me here, and I'm excited to be speaking to you and to the folks who are here today. Yeah, we have a great crowd, and uh, you know, it's been awesome to learn more about Nielsen in the last few years. Honestly, I am personally pretty riveted and and intrigued by data. I don't think everybody feels that way, but there are, there's increase. We have more context now than ever the importance of data. So I I just want to dive right in because we have some important ground to cover. Um, because of the work that Niels has been doing. And before we go into the nitty gritty, I know that we have a lot of uh, ground to cover. Can you just share a little bit about you and what you do with Nielsen and how you got involved in that kind of work? Sure, so I, um, I'm the uh, leader for our diversity, equity and inclusion communications, uh, but also the spokesperson for um, our Asian American community. Um, and the way we see ourselves is that we stand at that intersection of business, community and advocacy. So bringing the power of our data and of our insights to be able to raise up underrepresented communities, but also drive change is a big part of what I do. Um, basically, it's through PR, it's through thought leadership, you know, it's through engaging with directly with the communities like this conference. And um, I guess, I guess, you know, the how I found myself here was almost by accident. And I always believe <laughs> that if it's the right place, um, I'll somehow find my place there. And um, two years ago, and I've been in internal communications, so employee comms at Nielsen for almost 10 years. Wow. And I was thinking, you know, it's time for a change. <laughs> and and um, funnily enough, I was on vacation in Singapore where I grew up when my then boss called me. I'm going, I have to talk to you. It's really urgent, you know, and she called me. She goes, hey. You know you've been really um, involved with our business resource groups and you know you have a passion for this and an opening just came up would you be interested and Amazing. i was like yeah <laughs> right place right time exactly absolutely that's and amazing. then 2020 hit, so it became even more important to be able to be uh, to be the one that helps drive this type of insight and this type of work outside of nielsen so uh, i've cut myself really blessed to be here well, we're very honored. Honestly, Pat, it, it's it's very the thing that I've been learning by being part of the entertainment industry and being part of the Asian American community in particular and learning about what diversity and inclusion means. You know, this is a title that we're hearing so much more regularly now more than ever, which is great. But, you know, there's a lot of work that goes behind that. Those are actual titles. Those are actual people that are doing incredibly important work to make sure that representation happens. This isn't just about people who are on screen because there's a lot of uh, a lot of building blocks that go behind that in order for that to happen. And even once that happens, how does that get out into the world? How is that represented? How do we make sure that people engage and what do we understand from the types of engagements that we get, right? And that's a lot of the work that you do. So thank you, Pat, because to me, I think that those are a lot of the unsung heroes of the diversity movement. Um, we, we applaud the forefront people, the people that get a lot of camera time and air time, but I think the work that you do is really important. So thank you. Thank you very much for committing so much time and energy to it. Um, can you share a little bit about, you know, there have been so many difficult and important realizations and learnings in this last year in particular with, um, the importance of the narratives and the importance of the images and the ways that things are being presented. Are there any key things right off the top that you would like to share from what you've been learning and the reports that have been coming out from Nielsen? Because that's really important for everybody here that's learning how to impact this industry and participate in it. 
I think it would set a really great context for us to understand, you know, what we're stepping into. Yeah. So, you know, one of the one of the things to to note, I think, um, you know, if we always take a look at where the community is, right? So the Asian American community, I think while it's unfortunate that it took that anti-Asian hate that we've all been experiencing to right. galvanize us, it's almost like that um, while the whole country was going through the racial reckoning, there was a r awakening for the okay. Asian American community and we found our voice, right? Yes. Um, we are super diverse. We come from, we run the gamut of people who come from South Asia all the way through to China, to um, Southeast Asia, right? Mm -hmm. And if there's a positive, and I try to be positive about most of the things that I, that I do and experience mm -hmm. <laughs> that's emerged from this moment is that it's created that greater consciousness amongst Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. That while we're diverse, we still face the same challenges when it comes to life here in the US. And we have a, a great research partner, Ethnifax, who did a survey of Asian Americans and found that we are feeling the need to defend those like ourselves, right? In 2020, particularly, there was okay. a 28% increase in those who felt like they need to stand up for themselves more. So we're using our voice to demand change, right? We've got more celebrities out there, more political leaders who are telling our stories and calling for solidarity. Mm -hmm. uh, movements like Wash the Hate, Stop AAPI Hate, right? Social justice organizations and Asian Americans advancing justice are out there, mm -hmm. raising awareness, educating all Americans, but also empowering Asians to protect ourselves. And of course, President Biden's signing of the anti-Asian hate crimes, right? Yes. You know, doesn't, it doesn't get better than that. It shows yes. that our leaders see us and are using their legislative muscle. Um, and our advocacy is driving effective change and that can only drive further collaboration, pun fully, pun fully intended. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I think it's also, um, when we look at the community itself, you know, the fact that we have the fastest growing ethnic group in this country is mm -hmm. one um, important thing and we continue to see that, but that growth is moving into new areas, especially in the South, right? Of the top mm -hmm. 10 cities with the highest Asian American growth over the past decade, five of them are in Texas. Um, so, you know, we're moving out of California and the East Coast, right? We are going more towards the South area, South area. So the, in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, for example, um, that commu our community has more than tripled in the past 10 years. Wow. So, you know, it stands to reason that these areas will definitely benefit economically from the influx of Asians and hopefully also provide more opportunities for us to connect and learn more about each other in the local communities. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one additional aspect that, um, you know, we want to also highlight is to break that model minority myth, right? This was mm -hmm. a label that was placed on us using our perceived collective success as a racial wedge in this country. But the reality is that Asians are super diverse with very different realities. And one thing that I learned this year was the income inequality inside of community is actually greatest in the Asian American population relative wow. to other groups in the U.S. So the Asian top income earners make 10.7 times more than those in the lowest percentile. Compare wow. that to 9.8 for African-Americans and 7.8 for whites. So, you know, this type of data is showing us, hey, there's a diversity here that is often overlooked, mm -hmm. that we need to engage Asian-Americans differently, but it's also an undeniable source of truth for why we need to act for and with Asian-Americans. That's incredibly powerful. Thank you, Pat. I think, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't kind of hit home truth. We we have experiences and we have perceptions. But when you have facts, this is this is undeniable, right? Numbers don't lie. When uh, people go out there and they 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 excavate, they go find out what's actually happening. What are the true experiences besides what we're seeing? Because what we're seeing may not be the entire story, right? That that might just be the thing that got popular enough to get in front of our eyes, um, and that's very very powerful information to have at our at our disposal, especially as creatives. You know, just something to another thing to take into consideration about what are the narratives that we're putting out there, and what are the potential consequences of misrepresentation, right? Even within our own Asian American community. There has been a lot of attention skewed towards certain communities, and there are others that have been even further marginalized within a marginalized community. And so those are all just things that I think are so 
fascinating and very powerful to understand. So I really just appreciate you sharing those those data points. Um, I think, oh yeah, go ahead. Let me, can I can just jump in real quick yeah. on that point, right? Speaking of the representation of our people um, on screen, right? Uh -huh. So I think given the awakening, um, there's also this more, this create the demand for accountability and people at the end of the day just want to be seen and valued, whether it's seeing our true lives represented or our true needs addressed, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Nielsen, as part of the media industry, we really wanted to provide some insights so content creators, publishers, you know, networks can act. Um, so as part of our Asian American Diverse Intelligence series this year, right, we, we decided to share some data regarding um, representation on screen. And um, we launched earlier this year a, a tool called Graceful Inclusion Analytics that looks at representation of different identity groups in on-screen content across the three major platforms of broadcast, uh, cable, and streaming, right? Mm -hmm. um, the premise there is that the stories we see and the people we watch in the programs and the shows on screen are really powerful tools that can influence identity, right? The way we see ourselves, but also help others learn about people who are different from us. So looking at Asians in particular, right? Um, we saw that Asians um, are, you know, the, the way we looked at it was, are Asians being represented in the top programs relative to our representation in the US population? And we mm. found that the group that's at or above parity is South Asians. Okay. But when you look deeper, right, there's also this great opportunity to improve that share of screen for East Asians and South or Southeast Asians, especially Southeast Asian women. Mm. The other, you know, and then the other interesting finding there for us was that um, streaming is where Asians have the best representation. And that's amazing because, hey, guess what? We are the ones who tend to be cord cutters. So streaming is the way that we prefer to watch content, right? Mm. So, you know, if you want to reach Asians, that's where you got to be. Um, but Good to know. Again, look, <sighs> exactly. But looking at the top 10 programs on the three platforms I mentioned, the broadcast cable and, and streaming, right, that were being watched by Asian American viewers, only 30% of them were representative. Two thirds we found had literally zero Asian American talent representation. Wow. So while we're making hitting the mark right at the top, right, there's definitely opportunity to increase representation, and that's really the opportunity here. If individuals, brands, and companies want to do a better job of you know establishing that connection better or, and establishing trust with Asian Americans, right? Yeah. You know, I think um, we can look to advertisers to place their ad dollars in content that is more diverse. It would send yeah. a strong signal to the industry, the content creators and publishers that you want to change perception and change beliefs. And for the publishers and content creators who are here with us, right? Um, you know, there's an opportunity here to act by green lighting and promoting more of that diverse content. You know, I've heard many times that there's a lot of talent out there. And I agree, you know, there's a lot of um, micro productions, podcasts, you know, YouTube videos and all of that. But letting them, opening the door to them, to the big streaming platforms, to being seen by that greater audience across the board. That's where often the barrier lies. And yeah. that's why we hope that using the inclusion analytics tool will be able to help flag and provide the metrics for the industry to show where there is a, um, an opportunity to improve that, that diversity. There's also the opportunity to increase your return on, on that investment. Amazing. And we're so fortunate that that tool exists because I think some people, there's, there's a spectrum of, I think, uh, actualizing these intentions, right? There's a spectrum of some people who really sincerely care, but don't know how to do it. There's those who maybe don't, and you know, they're, everyone's kind of on a different place of what can I do? And I think why we call our conference empower is because there are very many ways you can empower somebody either with data, either with just a word of encouragement, with a connection so that you have an ability, a gateway so that you can go from where you are to where you want to go. Um, and this is incredibly powerful. See so that you have this inclusion tool and hopefully we can get more and more folks to use it. Um, and we can create that, that business case. Yes. And also the humanitarian case, right? The ethical moral case of this is just about human empathy and creating connection between human beings that we are much more the same than we are different. You know, we have our differences that can be celebrated and hopefully people won't be looking at that in sort of an antagonistic way because we're here to just be ourselves and celebrate who we are and share our stories. 
And yeah. then I think that we are we are seeing some progress on that front, right? So that's great. Chloe Chow with Nomadland, you know, it's like wow, yes. first Asian American woman to have won that Oscar on stage. You know, it was such a proud moment. I think <laughs> I think I yes. had a little tear there. I was like, oh, um, I got emotional. Yeah, no, exactly. And and you know, I, I really credit um, the content creators and and the the folks who are here today. You know, for for daring to step out and putting themselves out, putting yourselves out there, right? Um, I think it's definitely the younger group um, of Asians who are daring to be to be different and who are daring to state their voices on their own. Um, we also have the media now that, that gives us the ability to do that, right? To be able to showcase um, ourselves and our stories in very different ways. Um, but you know, there's no excuse, really. <laughs> it's out there. You just have to be willing to go find it and mm -hmm. to be willing to invest in it. I love it. Pat, that was so beautifully put. I can't think of a better way to wrap up this conversation, though. I wish we could get so much more insight from me and hope that you'll stick around and enjoy, you know, the conference and watch it. And uh, hopefully we can continue to connect because we really want to continue to learn about the work that you're doing and to use the work that you're doing to create those gateways, to create more green lighting projects and, uh, you know, really make a change, because I think that's really the core of what people want to do besides become amazing artists. Those artists are there to, to create something positive in this world. So we just appreciate you so much for taking the time. And well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here as well. And it's going to take all of us leading in together to help change happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. And uh, we'll talk to you thank again you. soon. Take care. Thanks. Enjoy. Awesome. Thank you again, Pat. Do you guys like my quick costume change? Um, anyways, I uh, hope you guys are enjoying Empowered so far. Shout out to everybody that's been tagging us so far. It's really wonderful. I hope you guys got something very important out of that conversation on data. Uh, we're also here to make the unsexy thing sexy. I think data is sexy, but we can keep moving. Really quickly want to acknowledge our amazing sponsors because without them, we wouldn't have been able to put this conference together and to share it with everybody here for free. The reason why we have Empowered 2020 wins, thanks to our amazing sponsors, Sony Pictures, Comcast, NBC Universal, Warner Brothers, Hulu, for their film Plan B, Nielsen, and David Magdale and Associates. Thank you all so much for helping us create this amazing space for everybody. And a quick shout out to our community partners. So Y'all help us honestly just stay motivated and plugged into what's going on and also to get the word out about this event and we love you all so much we support so many of these amazing asian american organizations cape visual communications east west players the asian american film club san diego filipino cinema hate is a virus and the korean american a story and we also have asian hustle network it's been amazing to work with all of you guys and support the work that you all are doing so thank you for being here with us all right, so um, real quick before we dive into our first panel of the day, want to plug our sponsor Warner Brothers because there's something very special to collaboration happening, which is that our 2017 keynote speaker, John Chu, if y'all were there, that was a really, really special day. Um, that was right before his little film called Crazy Rich Asians came out and John was right in the mix, learning so much and sharing so much about how we can better you know, galvanize the Asian American community. He was learning himself. He shared that with me afterwards. It was a great day. And he has a film coming out with this dude named Lin-Manuel Miranda. No big deal. <laughs> it's called In the Heights. And uh, John has had an incredible career. We are so proud of him. And we're so thankful to Warner Brothers to come on and to be a sponsor for Empower 2021 to believe in collaboration. And uh, yeah, we're gonna give you a little glimpse of the film. It comes out on June 11th, so be ready for that. Uh, it's a great, great film. And here is the trailer for In the Heights and a message from John Chu. Hi there, Collaboration Empower Creative Leadership Conference. I am so excited to share the trailer of my upcoming new film with you. Don't miss In the Heights when it arrives in theaters and on HBO Max June 11th. Once upon a time, in a faraway land called Washington Heights. Say it so it doesn't disappear. Washington Heights! Lights up on Washington Heights up at the break of day. I wake up and I got this little punk I gotta chase away. Pop the grape at the crack of dawn, sing while I wipe down the awning. Hey, y'all, uh, good morning. Ice 
Mexico piragua, cherry, strawberry, and just for today, I got my mate. It's a story of a block that was disappearing. The genius is back! Yo, he should chance ask her out right now. Hey! There's something on your shirt. <laughs> Smooth operator, all damn. We all had a sueñito. And when it came to dreams, we had to keep scraping by. Maybe this neighborhood's changing forever. Maybe tonight is our last night together, however. I just want to see the whole world through her eyes. They're talking about kicking out all the dreamers. It's time to make some noise. We had to assert our dignity in small ways. Little details that tell the world we are not invisible. This is the moment when you do better than me. Because you can see a future that I can. But we go, we rap for people, let it be go. You made all of this? This is me. They used to say, if you work hard, you live by the rules, the money will come, the things will come. You ready? I've been saving up all my pennies in my piggy bank for this day. Today's all we got, so we cannot stop. This is a block. In the heights, I can hang my in my life, and I built my little dream, my sueñito, here, in Washington Heights, the lights. we're taking the flight to a couple of days in the life for what it's like in Washington Heights. Amazing! Oh my god, I cannot wait. Um, I also don't need to wait because I saw it and you guys, it's so good. I just had to say it. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it. June 11th, keep an eye out. Also want to plug that John's film for Crazy Rich Asians. It is, if you guys don't know this data point, it is one of the top 10 highest grossing romantic comedies of all time. That's what Crazy Rich Asians did. It grossed over $240 million around the world. And it was not, that was an unprecedented. So do not underestimate the power of a story. Do not underestimate the power of your art. And John was once a student at USC, and now look what he's doing, working with one of the best artists, collaborating with Lin-Manuel Miranda. It's so epic. We're so proud of John and so excited for that. Um, so thank you to Warner Brothers again for helping Empowered come here. And now we're going to go into our very first panel because we have been talking about the business. We're going to talk about business now. Uh, we know that being a creative professional starts with very – different beginnings. Everyone has a different origin story and it can be a grind. The hustle is real. So we need to talk about what it's like to be a freelance and independent creative because a lot of us st uh, start that way and stay that way. And it is a very obscure and mysterious world that we're going to get some insight on with these incredible panelists that are coming to the stage live. And so get your questions ready because they're going to be here to chop it up and answer questions and talk with one another. So our panel of professional creatives are going to share experiences on how they sustain their lifestyles as working professionals, how they network, how they find and pitch product projects, and what to, what to think when they think about managing their finances and more. Okay, y'all ready? Uh, I'm going to bring to the stage KV Vu. My girl KV is one of the most That's powerful, cool. dynamic, beautiful, eloquent uh, poet. She is a storyteller, community organizer from Atlanta, Georgia, and she is going to take it away. She's been doing some amazing work with Asian Americans Advancing Justice, you guys. She is out repping Atlanta hard. She is making things happen on the ground. Uh, she was Atlanta's 2019 Rising Star and a 2018 Fellow at the Center for Civic Innovation. I love you so much, KV. I hope you all have an amazing Thank panel. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Oh my gosh, can we give it up again for that amazing trailer? I did not expect that at all. That was such a treat. And I love how you're like, I also don't need to wait because I've already seen it. So I cannot wait to watch that. Um, but I first want to start off by asking you, the audience, um, what kind of creative are you and or what kind of creative are you trying to be because I think that will help um, us kind of answer our questions so that it's uh, most inspiring for you or um, to help you kind of gather your tools to take the next step to making your dream job a reality or just to give you insight on um, maybe <laughs> who this life this creative life is for and who it's not for because it's not for everybody 
So now I'd like to introduce my amazing panelists. I mean, when we look at the incredible trailer that we just saw, y'all, this is it right here. Like these are the next people who are gonna like rep us. I mean, they're already repping us right now. Um, so can I have each of you amazing people introduce yourselves? We'll start with CB. Sure. Hi. Thank you so much, Kavi. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Collab, and um, for this amazing Power Conference. Um, I'm CB Lee. <clears throat> I'm a writer. I've written a number of novels, including the Sidekick Squad series, um, which centers on a group of queer teens taking on a corrupt government superhero agency, the first of which, Not Your Sidekick, features um, Jess Tran, who's a bisexual Chinese Vietnamese American, um, just trying to do her thing. And um, I've also written graphic novels for Ben 10. Um, and last year published um, in the certain point of view, Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, which was an amazing opportunity to work with uh, the Star Wars team. And I have a novel upcoming this September, which is um, A Clash of Steel, which is a remix of Treasure Island set in the South China Sea. So incredible and so looking forward to that. And uh, James, what's up, James? Hey, Kevin, my name is James Boo. Um, I'm an audio producer and a development producer for audio based in Brooklyn. I'm also the showrunner and co-creator of Self Evident, which is an independent podcast and public radio program for Asian American stories. And um, I've actually only been doing audio work for like a couple of years. Before that, I spent uh, about six years producing documentary shorts independently. And then before that, I spent about six years as a freelance food writer. And before that, I was writing stories and essays of some kind since I was five years old for myself. <laughs> All the things. I can't wait to hear about your journey and how you got here. And Jennifer. Hi. Hi, my name is Jennifer. Yes, I'm in Atlanta, originally from the Bay Area. I'm a singer, songwriter, actor, and founder of Today Worthy. And Today Worthy is life and creative coaching. I have one-on-one -on -one clients as well as a community that I'm building of people who just want to uh, own the fact that they are worthy today. We don't need to wait for affirmations from other people or permission. And I'm so happy to be here. I'm a part of that community and I just love it. And last but not least, we have Fabia. Hi, um, my name is Fazia Mirza and I am a writer and director um, in TV and film. Um, also formerly actor, probably will be an auntie or uncle one day in the future on screens near you. Um, I, um, I, I, I mean, that's more of a manifestation rather than like plugging something. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, writing, um, developing TV right now, um, mostly in the half hour comedy dramedy space, um, writing uh, in the feature space, gonna direct my first feature. Um, I had a, a feature film, my first feature world premiered at South by Southwest in 2017, it was called Signature Move. It was a, a Pakistani Mexican rom-com, uh, also a mom-com because love is really, romantic and then also for me always writing about the struggle with the mother um because that's real you know what i'm saying um and i i love writing comedy i think there's you know in every dramatic space um there's always the comedy and it's it's also a way to have a conversation about really tough otherwise really divisive topics um and I, I am definitely the person who's like, yeah, we should make that. Should we make that right now? Let's collaborate. What should we do right? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it right now. Let's do it. Um, yeah. So to juggling many, many projects, um, whether I should be or not, whatever, but that's my jam. So I am getting a sense that you all are incredibly busy. So thank you so much for making the time to inspire and uh, share insight with us. Um, I mean, I'm gonna go, and give you some insight from the chat. It looks like we have, number one, the shout out to Fazia's glasses, amazing. And we have, let's see, we have a choreographer, a dancer, podcaster, we got writers, actors, stunt coordinators, singers, songwriters. Um, so that's who we're talking to today. Um, I bet there's more, they're just not putting it in the chat, but, um, 
y'all, if you have any questions, we will be taking questions and answering them along the way. So please just remember to engage with us through the chat. I'm such like a like a visual person and I just need that affirmation that like what I'm saying is helpful. So yeah, please give us that. So my first question is y'all are just so busy and you are you're, you're just so multi-talented. I just want to ask how did you get into your creative field here now? Anyone can feel free to jump in. Oh my gosh, we're all being so Asian. Um that was so, we're just like, no, it's okay. You go first. I'm just going to start uh, because whatever. Um, so I actually took the really circuitous path, um, which was doing the proper Asian thing. I went to law school um, like my family wanted to. I was raised in a pretty conservative South Asian family. And, you know, it was basically like, yes, you acted and did plays and did speech team in the band when you were in high school, but like now time for something serious. So I was an English poli sci major. I went to law school. I was a lawyer for almost three years. Um, but what I really connected to, uh, I, I started lawyering and taking improv classes at night and comedy classes at night and auditioning in Chicago. And so lawyering by day, performing at night. And um, really the way I found my path was, um, there was this class I took in, um, uh, when you're in law school, you have to take something called trial advocacy, which is like the objections and cross-examinations and the rules of evidence. But it really felt more like performing than anything. And so I tried out for the team that does that where you go into competitions. And I was like, this is like acting, not like being a lawyer. Also my favorite part. So that just rekindled my romance with the performance side and my artistry side. And so I kind of went on this path of doing both eventually realizing that I can't. So on a lawyer's debt, I um, left the law and became an artist, an actor, because you know, money comes in right away. It doesn't. Um, so- I was like, who? <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not real. Um, but yeah, and then I eventually started uh, writing because I didn't see really roles that reflected um, all my identities, one, much less all of them as a queer Muslim Pakistani um, woman. And so I started writing and casting myself and casting other people in my community. And then in the last year and a half, I'm transitioning and have transitioned into being a writer director because that really feels like the natural next step for like that storytelling um, component of, of, of my career. Um, yeah. I'm gonna, should I call, uh, I say, uh, Jennifer, you're next. Okay, that was very okay. helpful. Um, so yeah, I actually come from a family of artists. My grandma was a dance teacher, my mom's a dance teacher, and my dad was a comedian turned um, singer turned activist. And my parents split when I was really young, but I grew up in the arts. But seeing that my mom was a single mom in America, especially in the Bay Area, raising two kids on her own, like we grew up very poor. So it gave me a very realistic example of what it's like to pursue the arts um, and then being an immigrant on top of that. So it made me really think about whether or not I wanted to be an artist. And I had this battle for the longest time. I really feel like until the last few years, <laughs> recent years, because um, I didn't want to be like my mother and have to struggle. But at the same time, like, it's what I felt like I was called to do and came very naturally to me. And, you know, like a lot of times people are like, oh, my parents don't support me and all these things. Like, yeah, my mom like supported me in doing it, but there was no like monetary support in that way. Like, it's just more so go for it, figure out a way. And um, it's just been really persistent uh, doing theater at, in school. And I ended up um, studying theater in college. But even with that, I was an early YouTuber. I started posting YouTube videos of me singing um, since 2007. And I got to ride the early wave of that and built a community around it. But, you know, trying to make a living of doing art. I lived in LA and I always say, when I lived in Cape Town, it was when a dark cloud was following me. It was like the hardest time of my life. And I was working multiple jobs. Like I would work at a restaurant hosting and then I'd go to Sephora and work at the cashier. And then I would, work at a boba shop on the weekends, but I would fly out to do a performance and get paid more singing for 30 minutes than I did working like a whole month, right? So it was this like weird juxtaposition of like, um, I'm poor, but I'm making a living as an artist, but it's not making sense. So I 
I have a history, a long history of working multiple jobs. And for the longest time, I felt like I was an imposter because it wasn't my only focus. I couldn't just do music. And even like having a theater background, I never felt empowered by the community there in terms of pursuing acting. So I actually didn't pursue acting after I graduated college. I did a few productions, but you know, it would, it would be things like, oh, you'd be so great in Miss Saigon. And then like, you know, I just have to wait for opportunities like that. But um, it's funny because I just kept me kept writing music and I kept releasing original songs and creating a community, still tough, but um, it wasn't until I fell in love. I met my husband on Instagram and I married him within four months and I've been here now in Atlanta for eight years. And I just happened to move to Atlanta because it's just where he happened to be. It was just where a lot of TV shows and movies just happened to be filming. and. My agent found me on LinkedIn. That's not a thing. It doesn't happen that way, but they did. And I started working with industrials. If you're an actor, industrials is a great way to make a living where you're doing like HR videos inside. And I was like, yeah, I'm a working actor. Nobody sees the stuff unless they work at the company that I'm, you know, being hired by. But I booked my first co-star role in like 2019 for Lovecraft Country, which is like an HBO yeah, show. She and, did. Yeah. And it was really cool to be surrounded by a bunch of Koreans because of that episode. And then from there, I like, made it a goal to book a co-star role every year and I have and I was just on The Resident recently and um, I just booked a few commercials so you know you just never know because the past five years I really didn't think I was going to be acting anymore but still coming out with music acting has been awesome and I founded Today Worthy because from this journey it has taught me that we are constantly asking people to let us in or give us the affirmation that we need for the work that we're doing. But I realized like it was because I never stopped liking and loving the things that I did. And it wasn't for other people. And I want to inspire people, especially in the, you know, API community that we need to start investing in ourselves. And last year I like ended up working with a coach and I ended up um, working with a therapist. I still see my therapist and it's something we're still learning to invest in ourselves when it comes to self-care. And that's something I didn't see my mom do. And I think that's what's going to help us last in terms of the mental battles that goes as an artist. So that's how I found it today worthy and still, still living the dream by pursuing it and enjoying where I am now. But I would love to hear from CB now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. I love like hearing everyone's origin story because I too also had a very circular path. Like, um, like I went into science and then education, and for a very long time, like I had always loved storytelling, and it meant a lot to me as a young teen, as a as a child, and as a young adult. And it really didn't ap appear like like I never really took it seriously. Like this could be a career path, you know. And you know, I was. Um, you know, kind of navigating this space where I was like, you know, I really want to do something, um, you know, much more than like just academia. And I really want to do something that really speaks to my passion. And it come coming back to like that feeling when I was like, you know, a teenager browsing, you know, the library and not having stories that I connected to or seeing stories where like, you know, if you're watching a movie or a TV show, like, oh, there's an Asian character who's like the sidekick or like she's literally the best friend or just there to be like set dressing or to be there to support the main character's journey. And that really like struck a chord with me. And so when I started writing, I really was like, well, you know what? Like, I don't know who's going to read my stories, but I'm just going to do it. And if if it's just for me and like, you know, my friends read it and um, then that's that's enough. Right. Because I needed to like get the stories out of me. Um, and so I started writing um, and then my novel, Not Your Sidekick, actually, let's see if I can. Okay, that, that didn't work. Um, so this book actually came out in um, 2016, which is five years ago now. Um, and it's amazing. And I think my career as a writer, like I would not be here if it were not for like the queer community, the AAPI community, the amazing people that really rallied behind this story. Like I remember, like, like I wrote this story in 2015 and the book was published in 2016. And the, at the time, there were a lot of people who were like, hey, you're writing, like, like there's so much here. Like, she, like, the love interest is a girl. This is queer, but it's also Asian. It's also sci-fi. There's also superheroes. And a lot of people were telling me, like, this isn't going to sell. Like, no one's, no one is interested in this, like, story. 
and I was like, okay, that's fine. Like, whatever. Like, I'm, I'm just going to write it. And I'm really grateful and happy to work. I was, I was working with Interlude Press, um, Duet Books is their YA imprint, and they are a LGBTQ publisher. They specifically seek out queer fiction and looking and look to publish stories that have not been told that like, and so um, Not Your Sidekick was published with this small indie press. And then when the cover was revealed, I got so overwhelmed by the response from readers, from bloggers, from the community, just people who are like, oh, this is like a superhero story and she's Asian and she's not a sidekick and like she's queer. And there's so, it was, it felt like, like I was part of something and it it felt so like powerful to be part of this community that was like, hey, we didn't know we were hungry until uh, like, you know, you don't know that you're starving until you see something that you haven't had the opportunity to to have before. And, um, you know, like fiction, YA fiction has changed a lot in the last like five years, but um, it's been amazing. And I, my journey as a, as a novelist, as a writer has really, it's, it's not traditional at all because, <clears throat> you know, I published, you know, the Sidekick Squad series, I published two books and I, I didn't get an agent until 2017. And she actually knew of my work because of like how, like having seen it and like having, you know, with so many people read the book and, and review it. And, 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 you know, I had gone, I, I was in the hustle. I was going to conferences. I was going to small book festivals. I was like, you know, talking to people about my book at like, at like farmer's markets. And it really, and, and it really was, Um, you know, that journey where, you know, my agent is also Asian American and she, she, her whole, um, all of her clients, like her whole like mission is just like, Hey, I'm here to try and uplift marginalized voices. And that's been an amazing part of journey from there to go to being like involved with star Wars and, and being, having the opportunity to work with and continue to tell stories and have this platform is amazing. And, you know, I'm still in education. I still work full time. And that's, you know, we're definitely going to talk more about like the hustle. And and I'm excited to hear more about how people make things work. But it is part of this journey that like, there's, as, as a writer, I think, as long as you keep writing and you keep believing in your story because you're you're the only person who can tell your story and you're the only person like no matter who you are no matter you're like oh this has been done before oh this is like you know there's already enough of xyz i'm like yes maybe but no one has ever done it like you so yes tell your story Um, so I think when we do these like origin stories, there's always like multiple versions you can tell. Um, so I have, there's like a couple versions for me. Like one is, um, I spent about a decade working at a tech startup and then at the same time I was freelance writing and then I was producing documentary work, um, independently. And it wasn't until like 2017 that I felt capable of, of, of like leaving my day job. Uh, it took me about a year to just like do the math and like save up enough money and then find the right opportunity to like feel safe, to, to start taking a bigger risk. Um, but like, I don't think that version of the story is very helpful, uh, because it makes it sound like I wasn't actually doing creative work until I could like pay some of my bills doing it. And I think the truth for everybody here and everyone who's watching, I would really believe is like, you've been creative your entire life. Um, like whether you get paid has nothing to do with how creative you are or like what your work is. Um, and so another version of like the story I would, I think of myself is like in 2007, I started a food blog while I was living with my parents on WordPress. And then like the only rule I set for myself was I need to publish something every two weeks and then like see what I learn. Um, and I should have fun doing it at least some, some part of the time. <laughs> so like, I, I think I entered this whole um, past 14 years with like just two basic ideas. One is like, as long as I can protect some of my time and I can pay my bills, then I can make my own experience. And then on the other hand, if I need to depend on like someone else's power or someone else's approval to get experience, then like, they like, screw it. Like, I don't, that's not, I just won't do it. It's like, a, a, like an opportunity I won't pursue. So the reality of that is like, it basically closed off a lot of like career paths to me. Um, because in a, in a lot of um, industries, like that's the only way you have to enter the hierarchy. Um, but then on the other hand, it opened me up to like learning how to, to make things that I care about with really limited resources, um, how to ask people for help. Um, how to communicate like a vision or like um, 
collaborate with people on a vision, like how to build professional relationships that aren't based on like this person has power over me or like I have money for them. Um, and every single project I've done, it starts the exact same way. It's like, oh, I have this idea. Let's try one of them and then see um, what happens there. Um, you know, my previous documentary series, I started, it's a, it's a collection of 61 minute documentaries. And the reason it's, that's the format is because that was what I could do for no money um, while I had a full-time job that had nothing to do with it. So I could do this like um, and 12 hours a week at, at a minimum and then maybe 16. Like, I just calculated it and it's like, okay, well now I can do one of these every two weeks. Um, and then I was able to line up um, a publisher through a website that I've been writing for, uh, Serious Eats. Um, and then it was just like, okay, go. Like I did 25 of them and then stopped and said, okay, now I'm gonna rest and like see what I've learned and figure out the next step. Um, so I think like anything I would call success in, in my story comes from just like embracing my limitations and just saying like, the thing I can make today, like that's real. Um, the thing that I might dream about making someday, like that's, it can be real, but it's, <laughs> if it needs someone else to like make it real, then it's not going to be worth my time like right now. James, I love um, your, I mean, even before we started this, you really wanted to um, emphasize that your worth is not um, how much money you make or uh, the thing that you produce. And I think um, for me as a videographer, I'm like, you know, what, like, what am I editing this week? Um, and you know what, and so it just um, really resonates with me. And like, I think that every, like when you said that we were all like, no, like the whole panel, like, yes. Um, but you know, let's talk about money. Let's talk about like, at the end of the day, um, we are trying to do, or not trying, but uh, like we are doing this for a living. And um, I want to give some insight to the audience. How do you make money as a creative? What are the activities that you do daily um, or weekly or monthly that gets you paid? Um, Fazia, I would love to hear from you first. Um, you know, definitely uh, support and want to amplify everything that that James said. And I think that it, it it's 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 hard to it's hard to think about like you know, well, I want to do this as an artist and I have to make money and I have to like have self-love and feel self-worth. And sometimes in a dream world, I think we, like I'm a Pisces, I have a lot of feelings. I am constantly in a dream space. Um, and so I, I, I get that idea of like, well, in the dream world, we want it all to be one, you know? And the reality is, is that as much as the industry of, Hollywood or books or singing or audio, like there, there's still a capitalism involved in all of it. And there's money involved and there's food we have to eat every day and we have to, rent is expensive and clothes and car and gas, et cetera, and having a family. So sometimes you can't get all of those things from one job or from the creative. And I think the number one thing is that's okay. And it's okay for it not to all come from one place forever. You know, it's like even people, if you talk to people who are like, you know, making the biggest shows, sometimes they get like their joy from the work they're making in pockets, but also they get it from like, you know, hanging out with their partner and like taking a vacation or the things that that money affords them to do is sometimes where they get that moment of, or, or, or just sort of that quiet time. So, um, so I think that's really, really important, no matter what we all talk about to remember. Um, I, I definitely, you know, when I was a lawyer, I, you might say that like, well, she was a lawyer, she made a lot of money, but I think there's also assumptions that come with all the jobs we have. Like, you know, James does audio work, Jennifer's a singer, CB's a, an author, Fozzie is a writer director. They're all making money. They're making so much money. And it's like, I think the assumptions about these job titles, we should also kind of step back from because it not only prevents us from thinking realistically about the future, it puts people in boxes. And, and, and so I'm a writer director. I was a lawyer as a lawyer. I didn't make a ton of money just because of the circumstances of the kind of law firm I was in. And I actually still carry some of my law school debt. So um, I, you know, I started when I left the law, I took a job as a uh, I was doing sexual violence prevention work through comedic educational performance work. <laughs> and that meant I was, you know, auditioning for stuff and like learning about how to be an actor and doing theater while I had this 
full-time kind of non-traditional kind of weird job that was really fulfilling and taught me a lot and changed my life uh, where I was traveling to colleges and universities around the country and military installations around the world doing this sexual violence comedy education work. So when you think about like, well, how do you get that? How does that job happen? It's, it's my path. It just happened to be what I did. And um, it afforded me time to, you know, take some of the really t low, low, low paying theater job that theater work that felt fulfilling. Um, in 2000, I mean, when I made my first film, like how did I fund that? Because it was outside of the studio system. I was dating someone who made a lot more money than me and we found people to privately finance it. So there was a time where I was transitioning where someone was helping care for my life and I was applying for grants. I mean, to this day, I still, I'm always applying for grants. I apply to grants for living day to day as an artist. I apply for grants for films and projects and art you know, films, you know, et cetera, different writing, developing. And um, and then in 2018, I got my first job in Hollywood writing for TV. And that definitely, you know, changed things where like the, you know, I, I think there should be transparency about like, you know, the money involved in, in Hollywood and the industry because it can be really, really substantial even as a, you know, new writer. So that was amazing. Um, but then it's not like suddenly it's like, that's it you're done, you're good. Um, that only lasts so long. And then you're like, well, what's the next job? And then, you know, developing TV, everything takes time. So, you know, I feel really fortunate where I, part of why I do so many things at once is so many projects at one time that I can manage is they all kind of go off at different times and some of them will not go no matter how much time you put into your creative babies, some of them stop either being productive for yourself, your creative heart, your vision, your dream. And some of them just get are extinguished because the producers, you know, it doesn't sell or it can't move forward. And so you kind of have to stop putting time into them because they no longer serve you. And so the reality of the business is that a lot of things die. A lot of things, you know, stop, uh, having a productive momentum forward. So, you know, I, I do all, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I script consult, uh, you know, on the side, I, I do speaking gigs. Um, you know, I, I'll do Q and A's for, 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 um, you know, projects I've worked on. Um, but, but I definitely have found, and, and also I think it's important to know, you know, if something isn't serving you, then learning how to move away from it. I love acting. I started as an actor but it stopped serving my mental health and also my uh, pocketbook, you know? And what the thing that was paying me was writing. The thing that I felt really great about was writing. And so, and the directing started serving me as well. And so I had to make a choice that felt kind of maybe anti my dream to, to step away from the acting. But since I've made that choice, my, my path feels more clear. Um, and so I think when we're thinking about how do we make money, sometimes, you know, we have to create space to to make money doing something else and maybe acting will come back, which is what I was kind of, I was joking with everybody about that uh, earlier, you know, that maybe in like 10 years, the acting will come back. But like, um, yeah, I, I, you know, and it, it, for me, like I also, you know, in terms of really how do, how do we make money? I sold a pilot that creates income, you know, one of the series I'm TV shows I'm developing, that's paying me. Um, but this isn't forever, but it allows you to be like, okay, now I'm going to put this project over here. I'm making a feature in Canada and I'm also Canadian. So I'm like, how do I work in the Canadian system and get that government funding to make those movies, you know? So I think being able to be really resourceful and knowing that it's not all just going to come from one place is allowed me to sort of be in a place where I feel um, in a non, I, I'm not, I don't feel scarcity in this moment, but I'm, and, and trying to move away from the scarcity mindset, although I know it's hard to, um, but just feeling like, okay, I, I don't have to take that project tomorrow, maybe if I don't have to. Mm. that's just talking about the, the the scarcity mindset and um all these different 
things that you do to make money. Um, I mean, taking on this, the Q and A, the speaking gig, um, the writing, directing, um, Jennifer, I mean, you are the multi hyphen in my life. I never heard of the term multi hyphenate before, um, until you brought it into my life. And now I'm like, I am a multi hyphenate. Um, and I just want to ask, I mean, you from being a singer, actor, coach and community creator um what is what does the day-to-day -day look like for you and how do you make money because i mean how do you make money being a community creator yeah i think it started off with like the discipline of working multiple jobs my whole life like i know what working part-time and multiple jobs look like i've never only had one job and i really resonated with what fadia was saying about um you kind of have to take you have to have the knowledge and the wisdom of knowing when it's time to focus on that one other thing so for me i'm known as a singer songwriter first because i've been a singer performer with music since i was 17 right like in front of people and so people have that in their mind but the reality is it's the thing that brings me the least money to be honest so if i average like this is me being very transparent i have about 70 to 90 thousand listeners a month on spotify alone okay Guess how much money I make? Maybe $150 a month, okay? And that's before taxes. So that is not gonna pay my bills. It's maybe some gas money, um, but it's also being okay with the fact like, yeah, I don't do music for money, right? Like I, I could charge more for performances. I think that I've performed enough to know like I'm gonna bring a good show. And like, sure, like we get licensing deals here and there, but it's not something that I depend on for money. So when it came to like having other jobs, like I'm focusing more on acting now because it's actually bringing me more income. And you learn also like going into the acting industry, like, oh, wow, I'm actually making more money as being in a commercial than I do being, you know, saying a few lines on a show. And you're like learning these things like industrials. I never learned that in theater. Right. So you're learning like there's ways to make money as an actor. So what are you doing it for? Are you doing it for the glory? Like, do you want to become famous? Do you want people to know your name? Or do you just love to play? Like you love to play a character, meet people on set and create and being open to that. I think you have to be very flexible. And if you're not already humble, like the industry will humble you and you have to surround yourself with people who will keep it real with you. I think um, what really helped me too is um, realizing early on that I'm different from my friends and not being like, I'm different, but more like, no, my path is just really different. Like I can't expect to have that 401k like my friends do. Um, I'm not really into Bitcoin or Dogecoin. Like I don't have that income to just like play and like take risks like that. Like I have to really strategize on, I was talking to a client yesterday and I was like, hey, like you wanna launch this thing? Let's really go down on your budget. What money do you have to make to have a roof over your head and pay your bills? and everything else will be extra. And then you can think about like, how much money do you have to have to launch this product or um, have a production that you want to. From there, that's where you can take on extra jobs. And um, I still run social media accounts for a client. Um, I'm bringing on another client that like, you know, approached me last year and I learned social media because I was putting myself online early on, right? Just learning how to communicate, tell my story. So think about also the path that you have and what you're naturally good at gravitating towards and see what are ways that I could translate that into income for myself. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, like there are definitely times in my life where I'm like, yeah, I'm doing social media management, but I promise I'm still a singer songwriter. <laughs> I'm still auditioning for things. And I'm okay with that. Like, I just don't have the time anymore to have to like little myself to make it palatable to people who don't understand the fact that, yeah, I'm capable of doing various things. It's okay if your brain cannot process that, but also maybe it's time to think about whether or not you're able to do those things. And maybe someone didn't champion you enough to think like, yeah, I can have multiple jobs and still make a good living and have family that I care about who aren't, you know, bitter because I'm just being selfish about my art, you know, because I definitely felt that way about towards my own mom, feeling like there were a lot of sacrifices our family had to make so that she could keep dancing. My mom still dances and teaches dance to this day. Um, and I have to think about the fact that I'm going to take care of her, right? Like she doesn't have a husband, like I'm going to be the one that has to take her in. So what does that look like for me? So being able to stand your ground, even yesterday, I got asked like what my performance rate is. 
and I got asked by another artist, right, who hasn't been performing in a while. And I was like, okay, for this amount, like I'm going to charge this much. And they said, wow, Jen, you're expensive. And I was like, maybe I'm not expensive and you're lowballing yourself, right? And also like, do you know how much taxes I have to pay on 1099? Like, and I have to pay the other people who are performing with me because I'm not just singing on stage by myself. I have to have a companist. And I said, and if they don't value us, then they don't need to have us and someone else can perform, but I could be doing something else with my time. And also you shouldn't undervalue yourself as a performer yourself. And it's like getting to the point of being able to stick up for yourself and being okay with like taking, you know, not saying yes to a job because you need the money. So it's been a lot of like battle trying to figure out what will work, but I'm happy that I keep doing it and I'm still figuring it out. Yes, girl, you're doing it. 1099 life is so real. Everyone was like, oh no, 1099, don't even say those numbers. Um, so we have a question from the audience um, talking about 1099s and pricing yourself. Um, James, how do you uh, know how to price yourself and set your rates? And if anybody else wants to chime in on this one. Um, so I can answer that question. And also just going back to the question of like, where does the money come from? So I'm also, I guess I'm a Libra. I don't know if this just like rationalizes what I'm about to say. I'm just going to tell you how much I make last year. <laughs> um, so last year I made $60,000 roughly, uh, gross income. Um, 48,000 of that came from three jobs. Uh, one of those jobs was a series of instructional videos from my friend's tutoring company. Um, the other two were podcasts for brands that I made through agencies. Um, that was like five months of work for those three jobs. Um, 6,000 of my income was unemployment during the pandemic, which wouldn't have existed, right? Because freelancers, uh, 10 and workers usually don't get unemployment insurance. Uh, so it was an exception. Uh, 5,000 of my income was working for my, that same friend's tutoring company, um, helping people get the, get into, uh, MBA programs where we charge $280 per hour to help people who are mostly already wealthy, you know, like go to business school, become more wealthy. Um, and then a thousand dollars was from my show, um, where I've spent the vast majority of my time for the past two years, uh, where we've calculated that in 2020, we did $168,000 of unpaid work, um, which is what we say when we're fundraising. Um, and so in terms of like pricing myself, um, I think there's two approaches. One is definitely like, just decide what you need. Um, like I do a lot of coaching with my colleagues also, which is like, you need to have a number for your month. That's like, you're, you have to have this amount of money to be healthy. Um, and then on top of that, add your savings and, and other goals, other things you want to do, have, pay for a vacation, um, support a family member, like whatever it is or other priorities. Um, and then just um, see how much work you're willing to, to do hourly or daily and then like have a rate to start with. So you can start. It's all based on what you need. Um, and then you're just kind of colliding that with what like the company is trying to get away with every single time. Um, and that's just business. Um, because like the rates that like when I talk about doing these um, agency jobs, like the money makes absolutely no sense. Like so much money is being spent on this thing that's not even a real, I mean, not to be very offensive, but like to me is not like an original story. It's a commercial. Um, and we, we do our best to try to make it engaging. You know, that's how branded content works. But um, the amount of money just like it, you can't begin to rationalize like that is what someone's time is worth. It's just where the money is. Um, and so I think balancing those two like ideas and then kind of doing the puzzle from there is how I approach it. And um, my overall strategy, like you can kind of tell, it's like, it's all redistribution. Like I love redistribution, talk about uh, politics or talk about business, like money is in certain places, you want it to go somewhere else. Um, and then the rest is what you're comfortable with, like to get it to move where you want it to move. Yes, get it to yeah. move where you want it to move. Thank you for uh, that Libra energy and sharing those numbers. I definitely was, um, you know, before I, so I started a full-time job in admin and in, um, in education in 2019. And before that, I was definitely living that freelance life. I was working at least three or four jobs. I was freelance editing. I was ghostwriting. I was working in photography. Um, I also worked for a nonprofit agency and that was great because I love like working with kids and, and um, but like, I think at the time I was living with my parents and I was also making about 12,000 to maybe $16,000 a year, like just under the poverty line. And that's, that's total what like people think like, Oh, you're an author, you're a book writer. You must be making so much money. And I'm like, no, you think about like, you, you could be a New York times bestselling author and also be homeless, you know, like things when people think about like the, the scale of books, like how much money 
does it actually like can you make a living as an author yes maybe um but most people I know also have other ways to support themselves in other ways. And it's also an industry where there's no like health insurance attached to it, like many freelancers know. And so um, living that freelance life, I think at my ghostwriting, you know, I, I did so many jobs that I was like, you know, this is purely just to pay the bills. I have no passion attached to any of this. Like I would write like, you know, like the little descriptions and catalogs or like your like in-flight magazine and like little articles, like, I don't care. It doesn't have my name attached to it. It's just, you know, I'm I'm creating content. And there's a, a point when as a freelance creator where you are doing creative work, but it's not for your own creativity, where you're burning out on just like, I'm doing this to stay alive. I'm doing this to keep a roof over my head. I'm doing this in order so I can theoretically in order to do other things, but I don't have time to work on my own projects because I'm constantly doing these small projects to pay the bills. And so um, taking the decision to, to work a full-time job, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna lose time, I'm gonna lose flexibility, but it also gave me much more freedom in that like, now I have a steady paycheck and I, I work and I have, you know, 40 hours a week, but I also have, you know, I don't, have to worry about my writing having to support me right now at this time. And I feel very lucky and grateful for that. And there's a lot of times, because when I was freelance, I was like, oh, I wish I had a full time. And now that I'm full time, I'm also like, I wish I was also freelance because I would like to have that flexibility again. Because I'm like, oh, I don't have time to just like sit and just like write all day if I wanted to. Um, and so carving out the time to to work on my projects is, is different, but I make it work, right? Because we live in a capitalist society and we live in a society where we have to make it work. And I'm, I love hearing everyone's journey. And I, I think there's, there's no wrong way to get there. And there's no shame in having to do like, like you don't, like people say like, oh, you need to like love what you do. But there's a point in the day where like, there are some jobs that like they can just, be a job like you know and there and sometimes maybe doing that job will allow you to do what you love and not have to turn what you love like every single love into a hustle because then like then you turn that into resentment right and then you're like you know I love my art but I have to do this art that doesn't speak to me I have to uh, do something that 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 I don't feel personally connected to. And so, you know, I hope that all the young creatives out there, people who are aspiring to do, they're like, I've always wanted to try this. I've always wanted to try that. There's no wrong time to start and there's no wrong way to start. Ooh, that takes me to my next question, which is, it's like, there's no wrong way to start. There's no wrong time to start. That's such a good takeaway that I feel like I can just like, put that on my chalkboard and it just stays there. Um, what are some things that you wish you knew um, when you were starting out that it's like, this is my mantra, you know, um, Fazia? I mean, I think a lot of this, everything, honestly, everything everyone has said, I wish I knew. And, you know, it's definitely a balance where maybe if I knew all of this, I wouldn't have just been like, I'm gonna leave the law and do whatever. Like, or, you know, maybe, maybe sometimes we need a little bit, bit of that courage or the unknown and uh, the uncertainty and a little bit of fear. Like maybe that's good to help us take those bold choices. Um, but I, you know, and I have no problem admitting like how naive I really was. I truly thought, and I, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that I'm not alone in this even now. Like I truly thought that I was like, well, I felt this like talent and I felt like my own like gut draw and um, natural instincts for the work that I, the artistry I was doing, the acting field world and acting as a performer. And I was like, I feel it, it's in me. And I really thought that it would just take a couple jobs. And, and it seems ridiculous, right? Because it is ridiculous and also, it's a real truth that I think a lot of people think is just gonna happen. And I think that, you know, maybe it's especially now that we have, we're so close to engaging in, like we, like we can make a TikTok and we can get a million views and we can do that. Like there's so much, like through social media, we're just so close to being like one viral meme away from fame and notoriety 
and 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 so it feels like everything is just within our grasp but that is that can happen and yet you might not be able to earn a living a steady living being an artist or making memes or making tiktoks um a great example i think like i i directed on a, a soapy gay series called hidden canyons that uh, we're actually shooting season two um in june and my fellow director slash the creator uh, of the series po put it up on TikTok, uh, on TikTok. It's I think the first series on TikTok. It's gotten like three and a half million views and tons of comments. Like people are super engaged, but there's no money in it. No one's making, <laughs> there was no, you know, there, we even talked to the people at TikTok, you know, there's no funding coming in. Like we're not rolling in it. Like those views are, something we can talk about it's a way we can fuel the next step it's a great marketing tool and but but i know better now than to put all of my hopes and dreams on 3.5 million views i know that that's one thing that i can talk about you know what i'm saying and so um I think that uh i really i i and the other thing is is that it, things do take time and I, I think that it doesn't matter what your age, what your field, how good you are, just find that sense of like grounding in yourself. Like no matter how talented you are, be okay with something if it's going to take a minute. And, you know, I was telling all of our panelists and, and, and Kavi, we were talking like things take time, even a contract to, can take time. Like you know, I mentioned I sold a pilot, but it took six months for that contract to even be a thing. And then another month for me to get my first paycheck and it comes in steps. So, I mean, I, I was, I was needing that money and it's, I, you know, it's like when you're like, oh, but I got it. It's like, you don't got it until it's in your bank account. And, and so I think that's another like step that we forget. And that is real, no matter like whether it's, you know, making $60,000 a year or making $6 million, a like those, those points of reality are still true. It is not real until you have that money. Even when the contract is signed, it doesn't mean you're gonna get paid. Like there's, there could be a global pandemic and then everything goes away and force majeure. So, so I think just being really realistic and it doesn't take away from how good you are, how talented you are, how passionate you are, how Libra or Pisces you are, like, like all of these things can be true at the same time. Yes. All right, y'all, we only have a couple more minutes. I could listen to you all day and I'm taking notes on the side if you can't tell, but if each of you could give one, just one sentence, one rule or mantra, um, it could be that there are no rules, but if you could give just one nugget, what would it be? CB? I would say to go for it. Like there's so many, like people are like, oh, I'm afraid to take this risk. I'm afraid to put myself out there. And a lot of it is like, you know, you, you will never know if you don't try. And part of taking that step is that like, you know, there's the great unknown and definitely like do within your limits for, of like, you know, what is realistic for you? Like, don't quit your day job and, and you'd be like, I'm just gonna like do this thing now. Like take your time, consider all the factors, but definitely like take that risk, like go for, take a first step because without that first step, you wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't know where that journey would take you. So definitely encourage everyone to try. Yes, there you go, take the first step. James? Uh, I guess I would say just always do the math, like give yourself enough time to get all your information together. Like so much of my um, sanity and like life comes from like one moment where I realized I was comfortable doing a spreadsheet of just like projecting things and then thinking about it. And um, but that doesn't mean you have to internalize it. Right. Like the numbers are like on a screen, on a page for you to decide what they mean, you know, what you want to do. And um, that's how it should make you feel. It shouldn't be like it's crushing weight that is like all these numbers are being thrown at you and you just like have to submit to them. Mm. Jennifer, what you got? 
I'm ready. So I, ha- I have to say you are, and it is already today worthy. And it's not about being first, but making something that lasts. And even if you are first, make it last. So just strategize and love what you are doing and love who you are. Mm, Fazio, you want to round that out for us? I I can't say anything better than anyone else did. And, you know, just, just trust that everyone's path is different, you know? And, and I think if, if this panel is an example, like all of us, all, like this entire group of people, every one of us has shared a different path for how they got there. And that's both the beautiful and sometimes frustrating thing about all these businesses and being an artist is that there's a path for everyone um, and it's not written yet. And it's it's yours if you just stay patient and trust and be true to who you are. Yes. So take the first step. Actually do the math first. Do the math, take the first step. It's not about being the first, but making it last. And Fazia, I wanted to go back to what you said when we had our intro call, which was be ready. Like when you say that you're the thing, have the thing ready. If you say that you're a writer and somebody asks you for the thing and you didn't write it yet, you ain't ready. So um, on that note, it's like, thank you it's so like much. RuPaul says, RuPaul says that, stay ready. <laughs> yes, stay ready. Uh, thank you so much to you amazing panelists. You can find, I think everyone's, um, all the social things on the chats. Uh, y'all, I encourage you to actually look at the chats. People have been just um, so inspired. So thank you so much for spending your Saturday with us. And I'll toss it back to the collab team. Thanks, y'all. You're on mute. <laughs> oh, thank you guys so much. I was on mute. My gosh. Okay. Well, I was just screaming over there for a second. That was incredible. Thank you to the this Creative Life panel. I'm taking notes. I'm like fired up. And by the way, just want to plug, if you guys are following along, you guys, all their uh, social media handles at Collaboration, we've been following along very intently, been sharing all their information. Do not sleep on that because these people are headed for big things they've already been doing. And uh, they're all inspiring for so many different reasons. So follow at Collaboration. Make sure to tag us for the hashtag Empowered2021. And we'd love to see what you guys are thinking, feeling, and experiencing along the way. But um, yeah, it's, this is just so incredible. I'm like here taking notes and thinking about all the things I got to do. And that house life is very real. Uh, but we're going to keep things moving because we have an incredible performance to share with you. So collaboration, again, as I mentioned earlier, we have featured, uh, I, I, we've lost track, honestly, and that's something we got to fix because we got to do the math, but upwards of a, a 2000 Asian American performers. Um, and one of them is back to share his music with us. We have sung beats here to share a performance. Now Sung is a beatboxer and he's a live loop station artist from New York City. Uh, he performed at Collaboration New York and then later on at a different trip to New York, I actually saw him busking in a subway station in, in Manhattan. His hustle game is so strong. His achievements are incredible. He's won the Apollo, um, he won Collaboration Star. He is a star and uh, he's just here to share an inspiring performance all of you guys to enjoy the music that he makes. And without further ado, here is Sung Beats. Yo, what is going on, collaboration? This is beatboxer Sung Beats from New York City, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be performing for Empowered Conference 2021. I'm a beatboxer, and I've been exploring music with the human voice for over 18 years. What you're about to hear right now is called live vocal looping. It is an art form of recording beatboxing and vocals into a machine like this called a loop station layer by layer until we get some music going. Hope y'all dig. Thanks again for having me.
Oh my god. Is everyone else like dancing? I was going crazy. I'm sorry. I had to calm it down so I could come back and host. Thank you, Sung. That was absolutely incredible. I hope you guys are all enjoying that. That I'm so hyped right now and I need to be chill because I'm hosting a conference, but it's fine. It's a collaboration and power conference. We don't have to, you know, we're a different kind of professional. You know what I mean? So just stay true to yourself. Okay, so we are going to share another amazing plug for one of our amazing sponsors, which is HBO. And HBO has been putting on the HBO APA Visionaries competition for several years now. And it is a short film competition that provides emerging uh, directors of Asian or Asian Pacific Islander descent the opportunity to showcase their work. So this year, the theme was called Taking the Lead. And so all the emerging directors have created short films. Those films are going to premiere this September at the Visual Communications Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. So shout out to VC, we love you all so much. And uh, here's a quick word from our sponsors at HBO about their APA visionary. So all y'all filmmakers, pay attention and submit. 我跟你说个秘密。When we're telling stories like this, it's greater than us. Let's do this. Take a step into the unknown. You're gonna like this. HBO is continuing to give Asian Pacific American filmmakers the opportunity of a lifetime. I want to shed light on the fun, the passion, the liveliness of Chinese culture. Okay, now let's do a funny one. Hey guys, I'm Jimmy O Yang. I know I'm about like the 10th Asian on the list that they wanted here. If you're a director of Asian or Pacific Islander descent, what are you waiting for? We want to hear about the dramatic, mm. the funny, <laughs> the awkward experiences that reflect the modern day Asian American. Yeah. Please not, it's a new couch. Ah, uh, sorry. 
Obviously, there just aren't enough Asian American stories being told, and I hope to be part of that change. One of my biggest goals is to raise the voices of those who are underrepresented. It's time to share our stories and be part of the conversation. Please, Emma! I'll take care of us. Growing up Asian American, you're aware of stereotypes. I wanted to have a new examination of the reality. To be able to put my work on HBO is, a, is literally a dream come true. It means everything. Congratulations to our winner. This is huge for our film, this is huge for us as filmmakers. Thank you so much, HBO. Thank you, HBO, for allowing us to share our work on all HBO platforms. And put me in your movies when you get famous. <laughs> oh, Jimmy. Sidebar, Jimmy oh Yang, one of his first uh, comedy stand-up routines was at a collaboration show. God, I love Jimmy oh Yang, And thank you to everybody at HBO. I was just so proud. I'm getting very emotional watching that and seeing how far we've come in such a short amount of time. We have a lot more ahead of us and we're very excited. And that takes us to our second panel where we are going to talk with some titans of the industry and not just the industry, but of the community and of the space, because these are folks that are industry leaders. These are people that are making change in film, TV, and music. Um, and we're gonna talk about diversity in media. And this conversation is always very meaningful and really eye-opening in this particular space because there's a lot of that corporate talk and there's a lot of these kind of, um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not clowning, I'm not trolling on anybody, but it's, it's a different, way of packaging the conversation. And here at Collaboration, we want to have honest discussions. As you guys saw in the last panel, we want to understand what are we really thinking? What are we really going through? And how can we create actual change? Um, it's just a different space for that. And we will see how this conversation around diversity and inclusion has changed over the last few years. And honestly, what these industry leaders are doing strategically to sustain the momentum that we've gained. And that is very important work. And this is moderated by our very own Martin Yue, who is our behind the scenes magic master. And he is my former associate director. He's the producer of my podcast. He produces so many podcasts. He runs the Potluck Podcast uh, Collective, which is incredible. It's a collective of Asian American podcasters and storytellers. So so excited to have Marvin moderate this panel. So welcoming him to the stage, or he's gonna welcome himself to the stage because he's doing this. And there he is. Take it away, Marvin. Hello. I'm Have a running great this panel. conference on you are. Turn you off and add. Hi, welcome to uh, the second panel of Empower. We're so happy that you are here. Um, this panel is all about diversity. And um, when we were conceptualizing this panel, we were thinking about how, you know, there's so many, we, we hear a lot about how diversity is good. And I think at this point, you know, five, 10 years in, um, we've all established that yes, diversity is good, but so where do we go from there? So um, our two main goals for this panel is to A, talk about how the conversation around diversity and representation in media has changed over the last few years, in addition to find out what people are doing, um, what our industry leaders are doing and what types of actions they're they're making to, you know, make sure this moment is sustainable. So let me go ahead and bring in our panelists, our wonderful panelists. Um, who will be joining us. Um, hi, everyone. Um, like Minji said, my name is Marvin Yue. Uh, I am calling in today from Tongva Territory. Um, I am the former social director for Collaboration and still um, one, <laughs> I'm the lead producer for this conference. Um, still get called in from time to time when Minji makes the call. When Minji makes the call, you say yes, right? So uh, that's why I'm here. Um, but we have a really great, um, wonderful panel of, I want to say industry experts, industry titans, industry just leaders with us that I'm very happy to talk with about. And so I'm trying to center myself on my camera, but um, I'm going to have them all, them all um, introduce themselves and let you know what they do, um, starting with Naya. Hi, everybody. Uh, so happy to be here. Thank you, Minji and Marvin, for inviting me to this amazing panel with all of these amazing people. And thanks for everybody that's tuning in for being here with us. Um, I am the 
EVP of Walden Media. I run development and production, and I'm also the executive producer of the Babysitters Club. Awesome. Uh, Richie. Hello. Um, first, I want to acknowledge um, I'm calling from the San Francisco East Bay area on the unceded land of the Ohlone, Muwekma, Chichenyo. Um, I want to thank Minji and Marvin and all collaboration and the Empowered team for bringing me on. I'm really excited to be here and all the other amazing folks on this panel. Um, my name is Richie Tractivist. I am the founder of Tractivist, um, which is a platform we launched in 2015 to bring visibility and sustainability to Asian American artists. And so I uh, can't wait to learn from everyone here and share some stories. Awesome. And also joining us is Michelle. Hi, everyone. I am calling in from the unceded lands of Tongva communities, and my name is Michelle Sugihara. I'm the executive director of CAPE, the Coalition of Asian Pacifics and Entertainment. And Frankie. Hey everyone, my name is Frankie Yapinchai. I'm from Seattle, Washington. Um, I'm the senior creative manager at Amazon Music, and I'm also on the allyship board for the agents at Amazon Affinity Network at Amazon as a whole. Um, I do Asian American programming um, for Amazon Music and also flex activations for artists and, and labels on, on our platform. Awesome. All right, so let's get started. Uh, diversity, especially diversity in media, has been a goal for our community for a long time. Um, we've, you know, we all work in the entertainment space. Diversity and representation is very important to us because, you know, we want to see ourselves represented in, especially in things that we ourselves make and we ourselves see. Um, so, like I mentioned, um, the the what diversity means for us in the industry, it's not a static thing, right? It's something that has um, evolved, especially for us who work in the space um, over the years, um, where you know diversity used to mean we see our faces on screen and now it's, it's evolving towards oh now we see our stories now we see like the inclusion of our stories and like the equity of you know what types of roles what types of um stories we get to tell has evolved so uh, my first question to you all um is what does diversity mean to you and how has that changed or evolved over the last few years um anyone can start Or can call someone. <laughs> um, no, I'll, <laughs> it's such a it's such an, a, a loaded question. I think, you know, for me, uh, I always go back to the saying: you have to see it to be it. And so, for me, diversity is really a two part, two pronged thing um, in relation to this industry. I think we need to be able to see multiple faces, multiple. Uh, sections of the American diaspora, the international diaspora actually, on our screens in order to really conceive of what a diverse community looks like. And then behind the scenes, I think it's just as important to have the people that are making the decisions, the people that are creating the content be as diverse as possible. And, and I think when you really get to that equal playing field, which clearly we're not at, I think that the study that uh, Nancy Yun just put out um, said that uh, two thirds of Asian characters reflect stereotypes and there's only 3.4% that have leads or co-leads that are AAPI or um, in the community. And I think that, that that just shows how far we have to go. But when we, if and when we get there, I think then because there's so much specificity, because there's so much um, kind of intentional storytelling, we'll get to a place where it feels really universal. And so for me, that's diversity. Totally. And, you know, I, I don't want to follow up on, on that. I feel like it is not only the, the creators, but the people behind the scenes, because I feel like there's a level of authenticity that's going to speak to this audience, right? So I, I feel like when you say diversity in, I guess, like entertainment and what these content is being put out, if the people behind the scenes don't understand the origins of it, the values, the actual community, um, what that narrative is and that, that storytelling, that's going to be something that I feel like it's starting to happen. We're starting to, to, to see more people. I mean, even in like, I, I guess on the music side, I'm seeing more A&Rs that I meet and label managers that are Asian or Asian American or actually understand, you know, like we don't have to make music that is like talking about discrete Asian is issues, right? Like there's definitely like a larger landscape where we've had a similar experience. I'm like, 
you ask where I'm from, I'm like, well, my family moved here from Chicago, <laughs> right? I'm not like to say immediately, we're from the Philippines, right? I'm like, I was like, Rich, you had a good conversation about this. And I'm working on the Asian American programming. I'm like, I'm not the voice of Asia, right? So it's just like, kind of like, I'm just someone who works on the just programming and I value like our community members. If I have a project I'm working on, I'll call Richie and say, hey, like, what do you think of this? You know, like I want to make it as authentic as possible so it resonates with their audience. And I think that is, is gonna what's gonna help the, the diverse playing field in um, the, the next generation. Yeah, I mean, so collaboration, we work a lot with musicians as well. And we always encounter this question, like what exactly is like, diversity in music, right? It's not something that you see, but it's something that is a big part of a lot of our lives. Um, Richie, as someone who, you know, creates tools, uh, building discovery and resource tools for the community to support musicians, like what does diversity mean to you? And how, how, how has that changed over the last few years with, you know, we get, there's all this, um, I guess, progress we see on screen. Um, mm -hmm. I think music's slowly getting there too. And we, there are a lot of really big musicians, award-winning musicians from Asian, the Asian American community over the last few years, but because it's not as visible, you know, what does that mean to you to like be supporting the community through music? It, it's a great question. It's a question that still <clears throat> needs to be like deeply dived into. Um, kind of what Naya was saying, you know, if you can see it, you could be it. It's in the same thing where if you can hear it, um, you could be it. Um, it's quite a challenge, obviously, because, you know, music the way that we generally listen to music, we don't say to ourselves like, this song sounds like a Chinese American should be singing on it, you know? Um, and so like uh, the the landscape of music, um, it gets quite challenging, but I know from my personal experience, even when I launched this, you know, um, I mean, if you go on the website, it's broken down by ethnicity. Um, I understood very quickly that, you know, to be in the Asian American space, to truly be diverse, um, you you can't ignore the the whole thing, you know. Um, I knew that if we were going to pursue this work, if we were going to champion our community, you have to include Southeast Asian Americans. You have to include the South Asian Americans when you're doing uh, diverse work for Heritage Month. You know, it does include the Pacific Islanders, the Native Hawaiians, and you have to put that work in. Um, so uh, for me, diversity means inclusivity of all. But also, I think, especially in the last year or two, you know, as, you know, we've been, you know, victims of violence and other communities, you know, have, you know, uh, been put in the forefront of media, although the communities have been suffering for a long time, you know, we understand that diversity means all of us too. You know, uh, you know, Frankie's doing an amazing thing with Amazon, you know, where they're doing some programming and some uh, work with the black community. And I think we all have to see our work as just part of the whole thing. Um, we can't just be in our own Asian American space. We have to see that we're all part of this entire picture. Yeah, awesome. Um, and finally, Michelle, as someone who, you know, CAPE has two really great fellowship programs. You're, you know, providing, um, I guess, you're providing services that make up for like, market industry failures, right? Like in the industry has not provided chances for, you know, equity in terms of diversity and, you know, programs like your, both your writer's fellowship and your leadership fellowship aim to, you know, fill that pipeline. Um, after, you know, you've been, you've been the executive director for CAPE for several years now, you know, how has, how has your approach to diversity or your understanding of diversity um, evolved over the last few years? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I actually want to go back to how you opened this conversation, Marvin. You mentioned that this is an evolving thing, right? It's not static. And one of the things that has struck me recently is not just around the concept of it, but even the language. So when I first started at CAPE, one of my challenges was, how do we talk about what CAPE does? Because back then everyone was like, what is CAPE? What, does, what do they do? And it was actually at one of the very first collaboration empowered conferences where we had a discussion about how diversity starts on the page. And then that started to plant some seeds in me about what, all the work that we do around writers and how, that, especially in the narrative space, it does start on the page. And then over time, we then rolled out our executive leaders fellowship and then we talked about how inclusion starts with the gatekeepers. And therefore, I had these, the duality of the, 
the ground up from the writers and the top down with the executives and the diversity inclusion. And I loved it and I was super excited about it. And then in the last few months or so, the language is starting to shift. And what I'm hearing is, yeah, we don't want to use words like diversity and inclusion anymore. So then I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so then now I'm just trying to reframe it a bit. And I just heard something the other day on a different panel I was on that they're saying, let's just call it what it is because when we hear about these diversity pipelines or the diversity hires, what we're really saying is non-white, right? Because it's just a euphemism. So like, why are we dancing around it? Why don't we just be direct? And so that it's something that is evolving in just my own mind as well today is like, what, what is that word? Like, what is it that I'm really after? And that it kind of goes along the lines of diversity, but moving away from the actual term and, I think where I am at this moment is maybe it's reflective. I think earlier today in an earlier panel, someone was talking about how when we watch media, it, it is that mirror and we want to see us reflected back. But then at the same time, it's also a window because it shows other people who may not know about us, right? So there's that launch study that just came out that said like 42% of Americans could not identify a prominent Asian American. And so, if, if they don't even, they can't even identify us, then how do they even know who we are as humans? And that's a big problem. And so I know GLAD also has a statistic of 20% like of America says that they know a trans person. And so that means that 80% of all the information they're getting is from media. So what is that responsibility and obligation we have to make sure that the stories we're telling are, are properly reflective of, of reality? Yeah, I mean, definitely diversity. And, you know, I, while writing up questions for this panel, I also hesitate on like, diversity is such, just a, it's such like a, like, 2010s term, right? Like, we've moved on since then. But at the same time, ha we haven't really, you know, we haven't achieved it yet, right? So it's still really important. And I think what's evolving is our understanding of, okay, it's not enough just to see faces. Now we have to also see like participation, right? I think that's the main thing we're, we're all looking for is participation because big picture wise, what the end goal of like what we're doing in terms of diversity advocacy is to see a media that portrays the world as we see it, right? And we see a diverse world, especially in American media, like we see a diverse world, like the communities that we live in. Um, we wanna see that reflected on the screen. But we also wanna see, you know, like, we also want, like you mentioned, to give insight to, on communities that we may not be familiar with. Like, I, I explain it like this sometimes, where when a friend from out of town comes to like my my neighborhood, I'm so excited to like just show them around, show them where I grew up, you know, show them where I like to eat, you know. And I think I have the same approach to like Asian American, the Asian American community, like that I'm a part of. You know, I want to show them. Okay, I want to show them, you know, the cool people that are doing cool things and I want them to know the things that I know, right? Because, you know, I've, you know, I have taken the class, I've read the books and I have this knowledge I just want to share because the more people, the more that people know, the more, I guess, world, they're well-rounded everyone becomes. And I think part of what representation media is trying to achieve is catching everyone up to where we're at right now, right? Where, you know, I think everyone here has a, you know, we've been working this space for so long. We have a innate ability to know what we want, but that might not be the case. Like something that we really um, learn through collaboration being in so many different cities is everyone's kind of like the consciousness of like their identity, Asian American identity, Asian American um, um, diversity, even like just diversity in general, it's different depending on where you grew up and depending on who you grew up with and depending on, you know, where you are, right? Like a lot of people for the vast majority of, I think the country, like the only Asians that they know are probably on TV. So that's why it's important. That's why representation has always been important for us. That like, oh, <laughs> or the press, that's always, that's why there's always been that pressure that, okay, we have this chance, we can't mess it up, right? Um, which is why it's great that, you know, you all are either working in the industry or alongside industry and really working like your day to day involves bringing those ideals to to life. So I really want to take this opportunity to let you all flex a little bit about what you do in your your, your own organizations to really, you know, pursue that goal. You know, um, I guess starting with Frankie, um, you know, 
this month is a big month for you, right? You you're the leader of Amazon's like Asian Pacific Americans Month like campaigns. It's like you 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 know put together the the mixtapes, the the highlights, and so um, yeah. Let us tell us about how, like I, mean, I guess yeah how you became that guy, and what you what are you doing to you know um, what are your goals like what are your hopes that this will lead to in the future? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it's been interesting because like this is the first year Amazon Music has done a more robust APAM plan. So for me, it, it kind of happened I mean, like the last couple of years we've had programming like playlisting and things of that nature. But this is the first year where we have five Amazon originals and we're treating them with the same equity as we would like our video series. And we're doing billboards and we're putting Asian faces in Times Square and on Sunset and we had the Identity Festival, which was we did last year as well. So it was like on, on, on Twitter, our virtual fundraiser. But now it's on the front page of .com, right? So it's like when you go and buy your random, I don't know, sneakers from Amazon, right? You see this banner that says Celebrate APAM, which isn't something that as a company we, we've we had tra traditionally or in the scope of actually putting, like I said, a more of an authentic kind of way. Like there's actual people within the community that are speaking about these different initiatives. Um, Amazon Studios did one with Core that featured prominent names, uh, you know, working with Kate, working with Goldhouse, working with the actual community members, you know, to build out these programming. So for me, it, honestly, like my main function at Amazon is working on Alexa activations with artists and labels and working to make that Alexa such a big piece of what our music service is. Um, when I started there, you know, there was a, a need to fulfill kind of like, how can we create Asian, Asian American programming? Um, so this kind of like, for me personally, it just kind of happened in the last few years organically and just me working with the community, I can help find the right avenues to not only create the product, but then also work across teams to make sure that it's fulfilled with the, the same way we would treat like a Taylor Swift project, the same way we would treat like an Nicki Minaj project, right? I wanted to give dumbfounded that same kind of love in, in, in Times Square or Agent Raphael in Sunset, right? Like we can do that that same type of project, but let's give it the same type of care. And we did this year, so I'm super proud of that. Um, it's been a tremendous month. We have a series uh, called Group called Group Red by Jane by Jane Shin every Friday on our Twitch channel. She's amplifying women's women's voices, um, Asian women's voices, and she's had conversations for Japanese Breakfast. She did one with Joe with Joyce Rice and Umi about you know, multi, multi-racial um, experience of being an Asian woman. Um, and then the next week, this is another flex, it's for Jane, you know, I appreciate her so much. We're having a film um, called Message in the Music and it's, it's focusing on API women, starring Audrey Nuna, uh, Malibu Mitch, and George Weiss. And that's gonna be on our Twitch channel next Friday. So super exciting, I mean, with the current climate, right? Everyone's trying to find avenues to support the Asian community. If it's Stop Asian Hate, a hate is a virus like a lot of these groups are doing have, have been doing this work so for me to incorporate that within our music programming is super important like super special for me um so for me as an employee of you know a kind of a larger corporation and kind of um you know seeing this come to fruition obviously it's it's been very very fulfilling so super happy to be working on this awesome yeah the chat writing here is saying you're being too modest it's okay to it's okay to flex a little bit <laughs> um Naya, um, you know, you've been at the head of several projects that explicitly cel celebrate di and highlight diversity. You know, the most prominent you mentioned being the Babysitter's Club, which, you know, I'm obviously not the target market for the Babysitter's Club, but I did watch it because my girlfriend owns all the novels. And, you know, it was it was a really fun watch, um, you know, and said a lot of really important things. And, you know, it was very, um, I, was, I, I enjoyed it as someone who, you know, didn't read it as a kid because, you know, when you're young, it's like, that's girl stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, when you started saying that, I was like, no, but then you got sucked in. I know you did. <laughs> um, can you share about, you know, your approach in developing projects like the Babysitter's Club? And, you know, was there ever a time when you had to, you know, did you have to fight for the diversity and, and the, the, the progressive storylines that we saw on the show? Or was that something that, you know, you know, how, yeah, did you have to, you know, fight for that? Or was that something that, just came yeah, I, I mean, eh, God, I can talk about this forever, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that uh, just kind of going back a little bit, you know, for my company, I work at Walden Media. We're a family film and television company. We really focus on co-viewing, and 
So in the past, when I came on in 2013, there are two things that really kind of impacted me and how I started thinking about the kind of content I wanted our company to be working on. And fortunately, I had bosses and higher ups that were okay with that. One thing was that we had done a Harvard School of Education study on our films and found that 90% of our films had featured an entirely Caucasian cast, which is just really rough to see, you know? And I, I think just speaks to the times that of my predecessors. Um, and the second thing was I had a meeting with Stephen Yun where in his delightfully, you know, Stephen way, he was just so introspective and was like, wow, this has got to be such a big moment for you. You you have this power now. You can really put our put our people forward. Like, is that intimidating? What are you doing for it? And I was like, well, it wasn't intimidating until you said that, but uh, now I'm freaking out. So <laughs> um, I really took those two things to heart. And in all of our projects, I think we've tried to really showcase what the American and, and actually, you know, what a family can look like in, in all of its various ways. And so for the Babysitter's Club, we're lucky enough to have amazing partners at Netflix and our amazing showrunner, Rachel Schuchert, and EPs like Lucia Aniello and Lucy Katata, who fought for that kind of diversity. They, you know, from everything from episode four, Marianne Saves the Day, where we have a trans child um, and she's misidentified. I think that's a really big one. They, they bring out her dead name. And so that was a big storyline for us. But at the same time, it was very light touch because for me, I really want to be a place where people can start a conversation versus a place that's going to end in some kind of, you know, argument. And so I think it was a really great way to introduce those concepts to kids without, you know, really scolding anyone. It, it, it's which is the thing I think we're trying to do in all of the projects that we do. Another good example of that was just in, you know, dealing with Japanese internment and Claudia's character and her kind of awakening. The audience is learning, I think, in a lot of cases about internment along with her. And so we really had to focus on it from that kid's perspective. Um, but at the same time, I think it really just resonated with what was happening in the world right now. And then just speaking back to having diversity behind the screen, it's things like just having people even within our community. You know, there are things in Japanese culture that I wasn't familiar with. So we're all sitting on set one day and um, it's, it's, it's Claudia's grandmother Mimi in the emergency room and uh, in her hospital room and uh, the woman who played uh, the mother of Mamona Tomato who plays Claudia comes running into us and is like Naya we have a problem and I was like what is it uh, moms signify death in Japanese culture and there's moms all over her hospital bedroom and so we're like oh my god out 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 so you know it's it's little things like that it's little details it's it's having the right kind of matcha whisking brush. It's sh showing that sequence where we have the shoes stacked up against the doorway in Claudia's house when everyone comes over for a meeting. Those little things, to me, if I had been a kid growing up watching that and seeing my world reflected, I would have been so incredibly happy. And so we try to just think of everything in that light. And we're gonna get it wrong sometimes, but I think the more we can get it right, the happier I am. Yeah, I mean, those little touches really do it because there's nothing worse. And I, I admit that there's some families who do this, but there's nothing worse for me than seeing an Asian family who wears shoes indoors. I'm just like, oh. and you know, it's, it's so funny. I love, I love to all the boys and I love, I think Lana did an amazing job. I think Jenny is such a badass, And I think Susan Johnson, the director did a great job too, but whoever didn't catch those shoes on the bed, I was like, guys, this is just, no, that is, that is so <laughs> unhygienic. <laughs> all right. Um, moving from, what we're doing on the corporate industry side to what we're doing on the community advocacy side. Uh, Michelle, you know, you, you talked a little bit to us about the Cape Writers Fellowship and the Leadership Fellowship. Um, you know, this this has been, the Writers Fellowship has been going on for a really long time. The Leadership Fellowship is relatively newer, but you've gone through what, three or four classes now? Yeah, we're going um, into our fifth year. Wow, yeah. Um, what impact have you seen? Because, you know, the thing about writers, right, is you don't, they're not as, you know, unless they're a showrunner, they don't really get celebrated. You don't really know, like, who's writing. But we're always happy to see, you know, Asians in writers' rooms with on shows that feature Asians or just in writers' rooms in, in general, right? Um, what type of impacts have you seen in terms of people who go through your program and enter into, you know, the world of TV writing, as well as, you know, for your leadership fellow? Ah, thank you for that. So really, Cape's work falls into three different buckets. And so the first one is this pipeline 
training grounds, which right now our two main fellowships are our Writers Fellowship as well as our Leaders Fellowship. And the, the second bucket is consulting and referrals. So we do have the largest database of Asian American talent. And so a lot of people now, especially studios and production companies will say, hey, we just bought this IP, we're staffing our room, we need a list of writers. We're gonna shoot, we have 10 episodes, we need a list of directors. We're casting, or who do you know that's a casting director? And we, we're casting for X role, can you help us there? And so we're doing a lot of that as well as script consulting. And then the third bucket is Gold Open, which we do with Gold House. And that's about, we all know this is a business. And so like once we get our projects to the screen, it's very important that we all support it. But going back to the pipeline side, um, as you mentioned, we started with writers and our fellowship is now going into its 10th year. And we have multiple showrunners now, and we're so excited because now they are reaching back and hiring our graduates and staffing them in their rooms. So really what we're doing is trying to build a new ecosystem. So now we've got that vertical feedback loop within the writers and they're writing on 50 plus shows, which has been so amazing over broadcast, cable, and major streaming platforms. So that has been just such a success. And then as you mentioned, five years ago, we started the Leadership Fellowship, which is the, the co counterpart complement to that. And that's our horizontal feedback loop. We have a lot of our executives also reaching out and hiring our writers. And so it's, it's really just been such a great thing to see and projects that are getting made and people working together. And even like, so Naya is our vice chair, but she's also a speaker and mentor. And like from her very first year that she participated in our Leaders Fellowship, she was already talking to some of our, our fellows at the time who've now graduated and are doing wonderful things and hiring them. And so it's really just creating this community and it's been so beautiful to see. So what we, we say at CAPE is, that we are changing representation from the writer's room to the boardroom to your living room. Wow, that is poetic. <laughs> um, likewise, Richie, you you know, track this. You also have a database. You also do a lot of you know consulting and, and advocacy work. Um, how has you know you recently got featured on a on a Google ad, right, or a Google article, which was pretty cool. Um, Tell us about your experience building that database and, you know, your experience um, um, and how that experience has allowed you to, you know, both support your community build and build relations with industry. And how have you seen impact from the work that you do? Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, what I like to always start off with is, you know, uh, a quote that always guides me, which is from Oliver Wang, you might know as like a scholar, journalist, educator but that the story we find between the notes of Asian American music is sometimes nothing less than the story of Asian America itself. And so <clears throat> what kind of got, prompted me into this whole thing was, I'm just like a music head. I'm, I'm a super music head. And, you know, over the, you know, especially in the 2000s, you know, we've been making music and, and that's the whole point of Tractivist. Well, not the whole point, one of the main points is, for as long as we've been here in this country, we've been making music. And I think it's my responsibility to point, to show that, to show the artists that have been making it since like the early, I mean, as far as I've gone, it's the early, the late 1930s, um, but I'm pretty sure it's even before that. Um, but the idea is, you know, how do we make this information more accessible? If, if people don't know about it, then how can we be proud of it? You know, also, that you know, people since people have been doing it for this long, there's a lot of knowledge and and guidance that we could pull from, so that we don't always feel like we're starting from zero. Um, so core to our work was building this website. I spent a lot of time. I still spent a lot of time just maintaining it. So if you go to attractivist.com, um, I've it's about over 1,500 artists and growing, and I did it so that you could search by ethnicity, genre, role, instrument. And that's important because in that same way that the launch study is saying like people can't identify an Asian American, you know, I found that not so much now, I think it's actually gotten better. But when I started this in like 2015, talking to a lot, even in our own community, our Asian community, I asked people, can you name five Asian American artists? It's really hard for people and it shouldn't be that hard. 
Um, so like uh, part of our mission is, you know, to bring visibility um, to to the artist and also just kind of like make it easier for people if they want to know if there's a Taiwanese American punk artist, like you can search that, you can find that. Uh, there's no excuse not to look for it. You just have to have the interest. Um, so besides visibility though, I think something that I, I recognize, uh, which we've, you know, the other people in this group have talked about is sustainability. You know, you know we, we, we have artists that create, but it can only go so far as, as, as they can afford it. And, you know, we noticed the artists now, it's really difficult for them to survive. Um, and so how are we as a community figuring out solutions, working together so that they can sustain themselves they can make a living off of it or even just like pay the bills, you know, um, it, it's difficult. And that's where solutions need to be now. I mean, visibility, there's a lot of people which we, you know, which uh, like, you know, my, my wife, Trisha likes to call amplifiers. But, you know, we also in the back end have to understand like, well, you know, it's cool to showcase and all. But then how can we how can we make sure that they can continue going? We want an Asian American artist to make music for the rest of their life. Um, so I've had the, you know, I've been lucky to over the years, um, I think because I just nerd out over this stuff, uh, you know, people have come to me um, to to kind of like ask, like, you know, who's out there, uh, who exists. And um, I've been fortunate this year. So actually, I want to I want to say I want to shout out all the people out there who have been advocating within their own spaces. I don't think a lot of people realize that a lot of what you see, all this stuff that's happening, corporations, it's because of volunteers. These are people who work in the company. They're like accountants who happen to be part of an employee resource group who are volunteering their time on top of their nine to five in order to represent entire Asian and Asian America in their company uh, to bring visibility to our community. A lot of this stuff, unfortunately, they don't get paid for, um, but they carry that weight. So I want to acknowledge all the people who have been putting in that work. And, and that's, to me, a lot of the stuff I've been involved with is because of these volunteers, you know, whether it's, you know, Google, um, you know, I recently volunteered with the ERG at Universal Music Group. I went through the entire roster around the world to create this playlist and to identify all their Asian, Asian American talent, you know, Pinterest we got to work with. Um, the Smithsonian, we just put out, you know, incredible playlists um, that was super diverse. But again, these are people who just want to give love to our community, but it comes at their volunteering time. So um, I, I think my role is to be a resource. And for anybody out there, you know, please reach out. You know, the website is there. You know, um, it's it's there. It's easy. I mean, I really made it with the intention for your casual music listener, to your nonprofit, to your industry executive, to your academic. You know, the information is there and um, I will continue to serve. So, you know, uh, please, please use that resource. Um, it is meant for the community. Yeah. And I think it's great to hear you all, you know, talk about what you do, because we, we see this, you know, when we talk about community, right? We're, we're also talking about building that ecosystem, right? We're, we all support each other, right? You know, Michelle is, and Kate is, you know, building that pipeline of talent. Richie is making, creating that database. Both Richie and Michelle make the creating database, make talent more searchable, more discoverable, more, you know, to, to lift them up. And that'll help people like Nye and Frankie when it's time for them to, you know, get their companies into gear to hire and to create diversely to find these people, right? Because like, you know, I think the last panel mentioned, half the battle is just being ready for the call. And there's a lot of people these days that are ready for the call and just need maybe a little bit of help to be seen because, you know, um, as much as diversity has been a buzzword and a, a goal, we're still not at the point where it happens naturally, right? We still need to give a little push. And so thank, um, I want to thank everyone on this call, on this panel, for all their hard work and you know, playing their parts in supporting that. Because I think um, you know, this lot, this, these past five years, we've seen a lot of progress. And you know, those of us have, who have been you know, working in the industry for a long time, we've seen waves of like, OK, maybe this is the time when diversity will become the norm. 
And we've always seen that wave go up and down, but you know, this time, you know, maybe there's a bigger chance. And you know, like ten years ago, right, or eight years ago, was when Fresh Up when we had like three Asian families on sitcoms. That was a big moment. But today we have like we just lost our last one, right? Kim's convenience just got canceled. So, you know, hopefully there's more. You know, you know, there's de definitely streaming families like like um, Babysitters Club and. Um, you know, um, never have I ever, but on network TV, like, I think the only Asian family we have left is the one in Kung Fu, which, you know, they're dope. That, that's and cool. Young Rock. And Young Rock, right. Um, want to take some also, um, everyone listening, um, if you have any questions for our wonderful panelists, um, please feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, we'll have some time for Q and A in a, in a little bit. And, you know, we're all here to answer your questions as well. And we'd love to hear from, from you all. Um, so we've heard a lot, of, we've talked a lot about the amazing work you all do as leaders in the entertainment community industry. Um, you know, our, our audience is a lot of, are a lot of, you know, either aspiring early career or, you know, people that are starting out in, in the industry. Um, as leaders, what kinds of, you know, actions, what types of, you know, mentalities, like, what do you wish to see from our younger members of the community in terms of like how they approach their work and also how they approach how they think about you know, diversity and inclusion and representation in media. I think for me, it's just, you know, telling the stories that you're passionate about, telling the stories that you feel, you know, if you saw someone else tell that story, you'd be angry that it wasn't you. And, and you know, you just have this burning passion for. Um, and I think the thing that's so great about where we are now in the world is there's so many different ways for us to access your talent and to you know find you. Um, just just making things, just getting out there using your iPhone, you know, writing your scripts. There's so many resources. Obviously, there's Cape as a great way to get in. There's also uh, the blacklist. There's you know just straight up YouTube sometimes or TikTok. Sometimes when I'm worried, I'll spend an hour on TikTok and be like, that person should be making movies. So I mean, you know, there's. It's just a really good time for that. And I think just having the confidence that you are the person you have been waiting for to tell that story is is what I would say. Totally. I mean, I, I think for me, for it's like different younger creators, I think it's supporting your fellow creators and supporting your community. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know who's going to be a relationship years and years down the road. I think it's just being good to everybody, but more importantly, showing that you show everybody what you would want to reciprocate back. Show up to people's shows, like plug each other's music, podcasts, whatever it is, show up to the events. Like, it's crazy, but like, that is legitimately why I'm on this panel, <laughs> right? Like, I've, I've had relationships with you guys for 10 years, but it's, I mean, it's also kind of doing the right work t t together. Like, I, when I'm looking for music, find out new artists, I talk to, I look at Richie's site, I'm like, man, this, I did not know about these artists. Collaborations, holding events. I wanted to get a part of it. How can we find ways to sponsor it? Like these type of things for like be involved in your community and show the right authenticity. I keep saying that same word. It's not like my buzzword, but I just say it a lot. But it's like being authentic to people really goes a long way. Um, being kind of like finding your next avenue. Yeah. And I do want to plug in. Frankie's been a part of the collaboration family for over a decade now, right? Like it's, it's getting there. Um, he first um, appeared, um, he first um, appeared to us as the lead singer of a band named Lion's Ambition, which you should check out their music. It's really dope. Um, Michelle, right? Um, yeah, actually, I, 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 yeah. I want to piggyback on what Frankie just said, because, and this is why I'm also so excited for when we go back to in-person events, because one of the things that I like to say is, make sure to expand your concept of networking and network sideways, not just up and down and like look, look to your left, look to your right, because these are the people that you are going to be in community with and rising alongside and, and even just expand your definition of who you think a mentor is, because I, I think a mentor is anyone that knows more about something than you do. And so it doesn't have to be like, oh, I have to talk to the CEO. Like it could, it could be just a, a peer that has more experience in something that you don't have yet. And so that, that's really just something that I would encourage people to think about. And then just expands on when you have a project, think about who else you can include. So even for me on an organizational level, 
I'm starting to think about, okay, I'm in these meetings with these studio executives, who else can I bring to the table? And so I'm starting to expand like, okay, I mentioned casting directors, but what about your composers? And what, what does your soundtrack look like? And I've been reaching out to Richie more and more. So shout out to him. Um, we, I got contacted by CMT and they're like, do you have any Asian country singers? And I was like, let me call Richie. And so that's really, it's really great how we all can work together and find the touch points that we can bring each other to the table. Yeah, there, there are many country artists, by the way. <laughs> if anyone's interested, we could share that list. And it's cool. I mean, that's the diversity of, of our community, right? Um, we don't just make pop music. We make metal, we make classical, we make country. Um, and, and I guess, you know, to piggyback on what everyone's saying, you know, what I like to tell, you know, young aspiring artists is you have to focus on being authentic, you know? Um, because if you look at many of the artists who are succeeding, they know who they are or they're pretty close, you know, and I think that will guide you into making the right decisions for your life and, and also create creatively. Um, but, but also I think it's important to recognize what you're good at and what you're not good at. And if for the things that you are not good at, like, it's okay. You can say, I don't, I hate social media and that's okay. You can say that, but that means there's a gap and that means you have to fill it. And that means you have to budget to get somebody to volunteer or to pay someone to do it. Um, because unfortunately, and fortunately, I guess it depends on how you are as a person, um, you have to wear many hats as an artist. You know, it's no longer just about creating, um, especially when you're starting. So you have to recognize all the different parts of the process, fill the gaps that you either are not good at or don't want to do. Um, and then um, to piggyback what I was saying too is, um, if you study music history, uh, you'll notice that our waves in the ways that we have come into the light, right? Into like the media light, um, it always evolved around community support, right? Case in point, let's look at YouTube. We, we decided, let's, let's take a chance on this platform. But if you think about all the people that made it, all the people that were able to create careers out of it, how many of them were in each other's videos? How many of them were featuring in each other's covers? There was this community, this unspoken community, or sometimes intentional. I think a lot of it was intentional. Um, that's that's what lifted us up. Because if others are not giving us a chance, we can give ourselves a chance. And that same thing happened in SoundCloud. Um, you know, a lot of the electronic artists that came out, the producers, same thing. They were working with each other. Um, and so I think you, you have to rely on community, especially when we don't have seats at the table. We don't have our foot in the table. Um, but also I think for those that are aspiring um, industry executives, um, I think it's important to, to recognize that we are missing resources. Um, and we, it, I think it's a responsibility that once you have access to these resources, that you have to figure out a way to make those resources more accessible. Um, so I think it, it doesn't matter where you are. Like, I mean, I worked in finance for, for an artist um, that is important for people to know. How, royalties is a mess. Like people are leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table because they don't know about royalties. But that's something that someone who works as a royalty analyst or a financial analyst can help out with artists. Um, and I think those are just gaps that we need to fill and pass on. Um, because otherwise, like I keep saying, you know, our community ends up starting from zero after our waves and in order for our waves to just keep going, you know, we have to sustain it. Totally. And that actually goes with, um, we have a question from Sung um, that's asking about, you know, what do you feel the community is still missing or lacking in order to, to push um, Asian American um, music artists, actors, filmmakers, and writers even further. And um, I wanted to throw that question also to the rest of the panel, you know, we're all leaders in our organizations, but you know we can't do everything, and we shouldn't have to do everything, right? So, um, what are some gaps that you've seen um, when working in terms of diversity media representation that you think needs or should be filled? You know, honestly, I pretty much resonate with everything that Rick was saying. I think some of the gaps is the community support within the community. I think there's like a lot of times, even like 
the Asian community is huge, right? And it's just like we everyone works in silos. And I just I think about what if we had the, the same kind of like unity as certain communities that got together when they someone's album came out or someone's single came out or project or fundraising event, whatever it, it is, I think that is still lacking. I think for what's also kind of like lacking is a lot of the different people trying to make it into either a professional job or a creative job aren't as intentional. They'll have a business card with like 25 things on it. And I'm like, I have no idea what you do. You And I, I agree that everybody's going to want to do a lot of different things, wear a lot of hats, but you have to be, I think, to be honest, you have to be super intentional with one thing. You have to be super intentional with like what that path is, um, finding a mentor, finding support systems, and then also kind of like re reciprocating that same support across different angles. So that's what I think. You know, I, I really think that the community in general, we have a lot of work to do to support one another, even though there is great things happening, like Richie mentioned with like YouTube. I think these are communities that are in silos, though. What if all our communities got together? We are literally, what, like two thirds of the population of Earth right so it's like let's let's you know what i mean what 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 if um from the corporate level to the creative level we start working together a lot more yeah i i think to to just kind of echo off of that is there's still so much i think almost even even internally there's a little bit of tribalism there's colorism i think that there are still really gaps in the south asian and southeast asian community in terms of representation there and I think the default is constantly East Asian. And I think we really need to work harder at making sure that all of our communities, including Pacific Islanders actually, are, are represented to the same level. And so that's a little bit of work on our side of just making sure we're leaving seats at the table and extending the table. And then that's even, I didn't even get into the LGBTQ community, but that's obviously a big part of it as well. Yeah. And Michelle, any? Yeah, answers? I mean, I think I echo what, everyone was saying because one of the is the recognition of the intersectionality piece of it of our of our communities and that we're not just one identity but we're we're all multifaceted and made up of many different identities and so really recognizing and celebrating that and then I also wanted to highlight and underscore what Frankie was saying about the multi-hyphenates like I know people are are very talented and they can do all kinds of things but one of the things that struck me the most recently. So Karen Horn, she's at Warner Media. One of the things that she says is, it's a little bit like getting onto a freeway. So you're on the on-ramp, you pick a lane to get on that on-ramp. Once you're on the freeway, you can change lanes, but if, to break in, pick one thing, be super good at that, get onto the, the freeway, and then from there, then you can start branching out. Michelle's just being poured all over the place. Metaphors. She is. <laughs> she is. That's how she does this a lot. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I um, wanted to, oh, oh, can I add something just real yeah. quick? Uh, I, I think I also wanted to, you know, in terms of what is missing, just to echo, you know, what Frankie was saying, what everyone else is saying, um, something that I noticed because I'm really focused more on the industry um, lately. And, um, you know, what Frankie was saying, people working in silos, you know, um, we, we are not as organized as we need to be. Um, and I think if we make an intention within the industry to say, this is what we have access to, these are the people who are down to like share these resources or at least like give guidance on these resources, then, then we can at least give better guidance to those who need those resources or at least like um, what they need to do to, you know, to, to get access to those. Um, well, one example is I'm doing some A&R with uh, one of the music labels and Warner Music in the Philippines, and they're trying to bring an artist here. They're trying to like promote an artist here. Like, hey, uh, we need to do some PR over there. Who do we go if we want to specifically target like the Asian American community? Um, and so, you know, uh, it, it's it's not an easy answer. There isn't the organization of how to market, how, you know, what companies know how to do this. Um, and so I think just in that example, we need to organize a lot better. So I think it's a call out, you know, to a lot of people in the industry. Um, you know, artists, our job as people in the background is to help artists so that they can focus on creating. They're creators. They need their time to create. 
our job is to support that so that they can do that and not have to worry about the other stuff um, and make or make it easier. So um, I think we need to do a better job to organize for sure. Yeah. And again, everyone on this panel is, you know, that's what we do every day. And, and you know, we're, we're not alone. And, you know, um, I think the more the more people that join us, the more people that we bring into this community, I, you know, we all want to grow together. And I think, you know, I want to I want to I hope that we're on that path. I, I want to say that we are. And at least, you know, at least I believe it. Um, so. We're coming up at the end of our panel, so I wanted to leave our um, young creators out there with um, a little something like, because we all, everyone here, Naya, Richie, Frankie, Michelle, you guys probably watch a lot of stuff and read a lot of scripts, listen to a lot of music, and I'm sure there's some things that you're sick of hearing about, some people, some things that you're more excited to hear about. So, you know, as people who review and who, you know, consume a lot of media, I wanted to ask you all, like maybe as like a, a prompt for our creators out there, um, what types of Asian American stories are you most excited about hearing more of going forward? Like, what 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 do you want to see more of that come out of our community? Uh, we'll start with Naya. Yeah, um, I I like to kind of spin off of Marseille Martin's quote about wanting to not tell stories about black pain, but instead tell stories about black joy, and I feel really similarly about that in the AAPI space. I wanna tell stories of Asian joy. I wanna tell stories that make people want to be part of our community, part of our club. And I think things like Crazy Rich Asians and Bling Empire, and even though you know they, they might not have you know the, I mean, I think I would argue they both have a lot of depth of field, but some people might say that they're not super high art, but to me, it's like, those are the things I wanna see out there. And I want to see stories that celebrate us and who we are. And there can be there can be pain and there can be hardship within it. But I just think that I, if if there's a lot of stories about internment out there coming down the pipeline, like let's do the one, and then let's also just do all the exciting stuff, too, all the other stuff too. Like we we need some joy, and I think that's especially after this year. I want to see more of that. Yeah, Michelle, what types of stories do you want to see more people, you know, um, write about? Yeah, I, again, the intersectionality piece, but also just the regular everyday human things, right? So it's not just the trauma or the exceptionalism. It's like love and breakups and jobs and all of the in-between spaces. And I, that's that's more of what, what I would like to see and leaning away also just from the stereotypes and the tropes and just every community has them, right? Like, so like the South Asian community, they're saying, okay, maybe we don't need to talk so much about arranged marriages, and but we can just talk about us as people living life or, or even just accurate representation. Like if you see any medical show, like if you go to a hospital in your city, what does that staff look like versus what we see on TV or even places like Hawaii? Like, is it just a set dressing or a prop and or are you really talking about this is the community that we are we are highlighting so being more intentional and reflective just on on those spheres as well so just excited to see hopefully what what is coming down one of the benefits from my job is we get to see a lot of what is in development right now and so i'm very excited to see the projects that are being bought and developed. So stay tuned and fingers crossed. <laughs> Great. And Richie and Frankie from the world of music, what types of what types of stories or narratives do you want to see more of in, in, in music? I mean, personally for me, um, I, I don't think it's I think a lot of the right stories are being told right now. I think what I want to see though is it's great to have like agent focused playlists, but when is like for example, like a BTS just considered pop and not world or K-pop. It's just popular music. It's not, I mean, yes, it could be in foreign language, but it reciprocates on a billboard chart, but why, you know what I mean? Like working on, that's what I want to see more. I want to see like more like the country artists that we're talking about be on the country playlist, not the Asian country playlist, right? Just the normal country playlist and featured at these different events. And not as, it's more like normalized to see Asian hip hop artists across hip hop programming to see them in like the double XLs and to see them in the different publications and 
hip hop DX is right. We want to see them like not hip hop DX age. Like we want to see them like all together in one. Like I think that what I, I really hope to see more of that, more integration. Um, and to keeping that energy outside of APAM, right? I want to see like you know the application of these artists. I think is something that's what these stories are being told. And I think that like the application is happening in the last month. But what if what if we did this more consistently and integrated into like normalized programming? Yeah, we exist the other 11 months too. We don't need just one month to have value, <laughs> right? Uh, Richie, how about you? Yeah, I think two 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 things I, I'd like to see more of. One, um, one, we're in a very, very unique time. Um, unfortunately, it's due to the violence, but I've never ever seen this many songs that have been made specifically as response um, to what's happening. And um, a lot of that is incredibly powerful. And I would like that it's happening because that has been something that we as a community have been um, kind of been taught, like, don't talk about it. Like, don't don't express being Asian American. It's going to mess up your uh, stats. You're going to get less likes. You're not going to get as many follows. But people are like, you know, who cares? This is important. This is our story. We need to talk about it through music. Not that you have to, like, be super pro-Asian all the time, but if you feel it, you should be authentically okay to do it. And so I want to see more of that when people feel that way. Um, two, I also want to see and, and hear more stories uh, of artists that have been doing it. Um, some of the stories I love <clears throat> being able to share, for example, is, you know, I went through the whole Grammy Awards and, and you know, since the beginning. And, um, you know, we were able to identify the first Asian American Grammy winner, Grammy winner, which was Larry Ramos, you know, back in 1962. Um, I want to be able to highlight stories like, you know, I was just telling, you know, the, the folks on this panel, you know, the four tops through our Smithsonian playlist, we learned that Duke Fakir, who is the band's only surviving member at this point, he's actually part Bangladeshi and part Ethiopian. I mean, we just discovered that now. It would be so cool to highlight that. Or one of my favorites is the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. Back in the 1940s, they were the first integrated all women's band in the U.S., which, you know, one of the members was, you know, Willie Mae Wong, you know, part, part um, Chinese-American saxophonist. Um, and, and the stories are incredible. I mean, imagine being a band back in the day during those times with how racist it was. They performed at these events, but they couldn't even sleep in the hotels. They had to sleep in the bus. They had to sleep in their cars in order to perform. Um, you know, these are the stories that I think we need to highlight because we wouldn't have this conversation if people didn't literally risk their lives in order to to create music um, or to, you know to share stories. So um, I'd like to to pull out more of those stories um, as inspiration for our community. Great. Someone write that and submit it to the Kate Fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you. Oh. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to, can I just add one really quick thing that I, I, I wanted to amplify a movie that's out right now during this month that I don't think has seen a lot of attention, but it really speaks to everything that Michelle was talking about in terms of, you know, quiet moments of ordinary life, but also hits on uh, Asian country songs. Uh, if any of you guys, if none of you guys have seen Yellow Rose by Diane Paragus, it's a film that's out right now on streaming. It is so good and seeing a Filipino country star is just really, really cool, so. Yeah, check it out. Naya, Richie, Michelle, Frankie, thank you so much for joining us for this panel um, and having this great conversation. Um, really appreciate everything that you do and, you know, now, um, and, appreciate everything that you've said and you know let's let's keep this like like richie said let's sustain this movement let's keep this movement going let's not come back in five years and have the same conversation let's move forward going forward and you know that's on us and everyone listening to this panel and everyone working in the industry to to all move in the same direction but i want to thank you all for doing what you do to um to push us forward and with that um, i'll bring minji back to uh to move forward thanks everyone thank you Thank you, everyone. You all are amazing. I, I just feel so honored to have you guys as part of Collaboration Empowered. And also just uh, another shout out to our sponsors who are wonderful. Um, they have made this free for all of us. So 
Y'all who are live streaming with us, thank you as the chats have been incredible. Thank you guys for sharing your encouragement, your questions, but also this is going to live on YouTube and Facebook. So there, I know I've already been hit up by a lot of people who couldn't make it today because they have an engagement or something that they have to be at because we're re-entering normal society again here in the States. Um, but this is gonna live here. So let this be a resource. There have been some incredible conversations. We had such a great panel, the first one about money, about making it and having sustainability as an individual, as an entrepreneur, as a, uh, an independent artist and professional. And then now we've talked about kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the industry and the work that we need to do to organize better and how to support one another. So we are about to go into our third panel in a little bit, but let this video, let this live stream, let this piece of content be a resource. Please share this with others. This was meant to be shared. This was meant to be um, educational and inspirational to many, many people, especially those who couldn't make it here in this exact moment. So that's the power of technology. Thank you to our sponsors and uh, thank you to you all for being so engaged and, and being such an important part of this conversation. So we are going to have our second performance uh, before we jump into our last panel for the day. And we're so honored because we have Milk, who is a musician and an artivist uh, who uses music to write herself into existence. She had an incredibly beautiful viral video called Quiet that went viral um, in 2017 at the Women's March and it became the Billboard's number one protest song of the year. She has been an incredible voice for so many people and her, art, her artistry and her music has been so moving. We're very honored to have here as part of the Empowered 2021 conference. So without further ado, here's an amazing special performance for you guys from Milk. Hi everyone, it's Milk, and I'm so excited to be with you all today. I'm really honored to be able to share a song with you called If I Ruled the World. I wanted this song to bring some joy as we continue to figure out how we wanna show up in this world and proudly represent the AAPI community. I know for myself, collaboration has directly impacted my ability to share my voice. So I want to say thank you to collaboration for the years of amplification of the resilient, important, and powerful AAPI voice. I hope you enjoy the song and thank you for listening. Much love. Mm -hmm. about me, more about you, more about you, more about 
Kids to see the ocean, some kids never see the ocean. I'd make news more beneficial, I make every driver signal. Only love is my perspective, only love is my objective. I keep music in the schools and hear every point of view. If I ruled, it would be less about me, more about you. If I rule the world, if I rule the world, rule the world, rule the world. If I rule the world, if I rule the world, rule the world, rule the world. It would be less about me. More about you, more about you. If I rule, it would be less about me. More about you, more about. Thank you so much, Connie. Oh, Connie was milk. Uh, Connie Lim, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Very moved, inspired, empowered. I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the conference so far. Thank you to everybody that's been following along. You can follow us at Collaboration, of course, Collaboration with a K, and use the hashtag, hashtag Empowered2021. It's really great to see how everyone's watching and tuning in from their computers. It's Good vibes, I love the chats, keep them coming, and all the support and love is great. Um, before we dive into our last panel of the day, I uh, wanna really quickly plug our virtual networking reception, which is happening from three to 5 p.m. Pacific. So if y'all are connecting here on the chat, you've been speaking, um, or if you've been joining late, it doesn't matter, you guys can join in, and uh, we're gonna share that link with all of you soon. And if you were registered for collaboration through Eventbrite, we already sent you that link, so you do have to register to participate. It's on a platform called Remo. We'll all be in a virtual space together and meeting each other face-to-face -face and getting to talk to each other. Um, and as Michelle mentioned in the last panel, it's important to talk to people who are peers and around us. I know we're all aspiring to meet all the big ups, uh, bigger higher ups and everything, but also we are collaborating with one another. So don't be shy. A lot of people get intimidated by the whole networking concepts, uh, but it's gonna be good times and we're just there to connect and, and see each other face to face as much as possible in a virtual space. So as we move along, we are quickly going to share some uh, <laughs> something really amazing. Um, that's actually the work of one of our next panelists, but we wanna do a shout out to Hulu who is sponsoring Empower 2021. There is a very funny and very different and very amazing movie coming up called Plan B. And uh, we have the writer of Plan B in our last panel, but we're just going to quickly play the trailer for you so you guys get a glimpse of that and it's coming out this coming week, so stay tuned. Right now, puberty is telling you to step on the gas. If your vagina was a car, what would it be? Ferrari. It stays covered up and completely untouched in the garage. Mine would definitely be a transformer. You think you know her? Boom. Autobots pop out. I feel like if you're following the metaphor, that means you have crabs. What? We finally tried reverse cowgirl. And? Amazing, right? It wasn't that great for me, but I feel like it looked cool. I was on horse fucking and I haven't even had my first kiss. Oh, fuck. Look at Hunter. Who plays hockey in a card again? He's like an athletic librarian. You know, Sunny's throwing a party. Really? Love a good high school party with the liquors and the touching, all the other stuff, drugs. Big night for you. Inviting your crush. Partying and drinking. I feel so stimulated. Is this what white privilege feels like? Take good choices. <laughs> oh, fuck. Lupe? I had sex. What? You banged your crush at your own party? You are my hero. Oh, God. I was peeing. And a condom. What? I'm kind of full of goo. Let's get the plan B pill. Is there an alternative? You mean a plan B? 
sorry, but I decline to offer you the Plan B pill. I have a nice day. Back. Let's go to Planned Parenthood in Rapid City. Hey, do you realize this is our first official road trip? Where are we on here? What do these red lines mean? This really it needs a pension zone. I hate to tell you, but Planned Parenthood is probably closed for the night. My 24-hour window is closing. Ah! So the condom just fell out? I've been there. I'm sorry. Make sure that condom fits snug. We need the morning after pill. I got one more right here. That could be anything. I got some pill. Sunny. It's like a really small chance it might be PCP. Hope y'all enjoyed that. It's coming out May 28th, which is like tomorrow. It's not actually tomorrow, but very, very soon. So I hope you guys all tune in for that and get ready because we're about to have our last panel of the day, followed by a fireside chat. But this is going to be, uh, it's going to be wild. It's going to be crazy. It's, uh, well, it actually might involve some comfies. So I don't know how wild and crazy it's going to be. But we are at the Empowerment Through Entertainment panel. And this is just an amazing group of folks who have been doing amazing things in the entertainment field welcome you guys welcome to the to the virtual room how are you sup good to be here hey, hey, yeah. terrible right, thanks up, for having us yeah for sure i'm gonna do real quick intros but then i'm gonna throw it to all of you to do your little your self intro because i just need to be everyone's hype woman it's my favorite thing to do we have kato on the track we have chris jew who's a korean american five-time billboard charting music producer and entrepreneur out in atlanta georgia he's worked with taiga snoop dogg jack harlow e40 jordan lucas tori lanes k camp and many more y'all need to like check out his stuff it's it's amazing he's been a soundtrack for my life in covid so thank you for that chris i appreciate you so much <laughs> we have the incredible Bowen, who is the award-winning Vietnamese American filmmaker. Y'all have seen his film. I hope you have seen his film, Be Water, which was part of ESPN's 30 for 30 documentary. Super moving, powerful documentary on Bruce Lee. It was nominated for the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance, no big deal. Uh, and he also directed Together, which was a music video, uh, part of GoFundMe's, oh, not music video, sorry, a video part of GoFundMe's Stop a a Asian Hate Campaign and raised nearly $6 million uh, for that grassroots API organizations this past year. Amazing work. Uh, welcome, Bao. We have Lena Khan, who's a writer and director. She's the director of uh, Tiger Hunter, which was starring Danny Pudi, hilarious, so powerful. Um, and she got tapped on the shoulder by Disney, no big deal, to direct Flora and Ulysses, which is out. She's been directing uh, Mindy Kaling's Netflix show, Never Have I Ever. She is killing the game, and we're so honored to have her here. Hi, Lena. Hello. Hello. And then we have Desmond with his jawline, because that's what everyone talks about in his <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> you can stop being right there. Just... <laughs> uh, no, that's all. That's all. Yeah, yeah, um, he's an actor and writer. Awesome. Um, and he's known for his work on Marvel's The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We're so excited to have you here with us, Des. It's an honor. Thank you. And then last but not least, we just got to see a glimpse of her work in that trailer with Prati Srinivasan. And she is an immigrant writer and actor from the bustling city of Chennai, India. And uh, Prati has just been doing such incredible work. She's written for iZombie for CW, Titans with HBO, and most recently Plan B for Hulu. So welcome everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's an honor for so, us. Yeah, seriously. Uh, I Okay, so what I was thinking is we wanted to get to know and highlight all y'all uh, just amazing work that you've been doing because we've been talking through nuts and bolts of the industry, how to make money and sustain ourselves as freelancers. And you guys are kind of people that we, a lot of us watching are aspiring to, to make the milestones that y'all have made. Um, and so I'm going to take us on a hero's journey, if you will. We have a lot of writers here, filmmakers, uh, storytellers. We know that it's it's not an easy path to get where we're going. So we're going to kind of structure this this conversation through through that lens, not restricted. Um, but starters, would you guys introduce yourselves and like what your origin story was? How did you get before you started becoming an artist? Can you give that one minute or two minutes? 
little sneak peek into who were who were you when you started this journey? You can start with Des. Oh no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't get to go first. Yes, um, uh, okay, origin story. Uh, well, yeah, I'm Des, uh, Desmond. I'm an actor. Um, wasn't always the case, I guess, if we're talking origin stories. I once upon a time was a lawyer. Um, absolutely hated it. It was not my thing. Uh, listen, you can enjoy it. Some people really, really do, but I, I wasn't equipped for it. Um, and yeah, I'm from Australia. You can tell from the accent. And uh, what else? That's those are like the salient points. That's about that's about the most of it. Um, yeah, popped over here to try to make a career, and now here we are. Amazing, Des. Can I ask you a follow-up question? How sure. how long how far into the lawyer journey were you when you decided to make a little switcheroo? Not very. Um, I was four months deep into practice. That was it. And that was sort of, I already knew that it was done, I think, well by my like last year of law school. I was like, this isn't going to work, but I'm here. Let's just graduate. Let's just try it. Um, and it just didn't get better in the four months that I was working <laughs> in corporate. So, yeah. Good on you for making that decision because some people get far deeper into their other journey before yeah. being able to make that decision. So, yeah. and also, I'm you not, and Ronnie have like that in common. Well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we went to the, we both went to the same law school. So he, he pulled out slightly earlier, I think. Well, no, we, we, we launched out at about the same time, I think. But he came over here a little bit uh, first. So yeah, um, there's no right time to do it. Honestly, if you're like 10 years in and you're feeling like mm, this isn't working, then have that exploration and be like, yeah, maybe it's time to go. Awesome. Thank you for that. I love Okay, so we set the stage with Des, lawyer. Four months in, switch gears. Lena, how about you? Hmm, no, I didn't go the lawyer track, but I did enter UCLA in the engineering school. Um, I didn't spend that long there either. I was the same thing, probably like four or five months, although I didn't do like all of law school like you did, because that's, wow. Um, uh, <laughs> then I switched in my bachelor's in poli sci and history, and then I went to film school. So it was just like a lot of things that I was like, oh, okay, I can do this, but I don't know that I see this as my job. Um, and then, you know, stars kind of aligned and you got into the UCLA film school and I was like, oh, I can kind of put some of my interests together and that's it. Amazing. We know that that's not it, but that's the summary. <laughs> that's applause to you. Engineering to pause. Dang. Okay. Switches. I love it. Uh, Chris, you, you, you're you celebrating that you didn't go first, but now, now you're third. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was a horrible student all throughout school, grade school, middle school, high school. I got straight D's and F's the entire time. Um, so I knew pretty early that school probably wasn't going to be the most likely path for me. Uh, and then I got to college and started mass production. I've always been involved in music somehow. I, you know, my dad signed me up for drum lessons when I was a kid. So playing instruments and music has always been a part of my life. I just never, and I'm sure you guys can relate to this, but I never saw it as a realistic career opportunity, especially back then, you know, like we didn't have streaming, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have TikTok. There was no such thing as a viral rap video yet, you know? So in my head, it was just like not even a possibility to pursue music, but I went to college and that, I think that independence kind of gave me the opportunity to explore different things. And so I started going out and um, did a couple open mics and started rapping over my own beats and just started, you know, experimenting and trying different things. And then just slowly but surely eventually ended up in Atlanta, started working with a lot of talent and artists and producers here in the city. And um, yeah, somehow I got here. <laughs> Amazing. We're glad. And, and those those experiences can be really challenging, which we'll get into um, to kind of like, obviously to figure out your place in the world and what it is that you want to spend your time and energy on. So thank you for that sneak peek and that origin story from you, Chris. Uh, Prati, what about you? Honestly, oh, well, I was a student. So I went from directly from college to the HBO fellowship, uh, which, which was my start. But that's kind of like the most sanitized version of events. Like the reality was I was a straight up failure. And then I got at the HBO fellowship. So, I mean, I, I didn't necessarily have those experimental years because 
Um, I was experimenting so much in college. Like I went to like four different universities um, just because it was a combination of like being extremely unhappy in the, in the schooling environment and also doing a major that I didn't give two shits about. So <laughs> it was, I mean, I don't know if it's half of an answer, I guess. What was the major that you, you didn't, that, that wasn't speaking to you? Sorry, excuse me, I should have cleaned that up. Um, I was no, a classics fine. major. <laughs> oh, no, I was a classics major, which I, I liked, but I, I read everything early. And then the the test just, I was like, I don't really care about the test. I, I just kind of want to read this stuff. And then I was um, doing rhetorical analysis and lit studies to be a lawyer. Um, but again, I, that wasn't really doing it for me. I mean, I'm a professional writer and I had to do intro to writing like 101 three, three times because I could not get through the class. Like wow. they were like, can you read? <laughs> that was really bad. But that, wow. that obviously has had absolutely no reflection on the quality of my life or my career currently. So thank you. Yeah, let's we'll dive into that in a second. That's I think that's really powerful stuff. And actually a, a recurring theme about just the, the the choices that people make and how it doesn't end up actually being a barrier to what you want to do. These failures, quote unquote, right? Um, Bao, let, let's get your origin story. Where were you before you became the Bao? Okay, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I had a similar trajectory as Des, but I didn't even manage to get to law school. I, um, I, I remember like the day that I was supposed to take my LSAT. I'd been studying like nonstop for like six months, like 12 hour days, and I, um, remember like, you know, sitting in the car, about to turn on the key to ignition and like looking in the mirror and like, do I want to be a lawyer for the rest of my life? And and uh, my parents were Vietnamese war refugees. So I think like many of us who are first, second generation, we felt sort of a, a debt to, to our parents and wanted to sort of find a, a career that was stable and lucrative in some ways. And, and filmmaking wasn't that for them at least. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wanted to honor them somehow. So that's why I like pursued law for the longest time. But I remember like when I was little, my dad, you know, we, uh, we owned like a small shop and he'd come home late from work and we'd have dinner like at nine, nine thirty, And he would take out a piece of paper at the end of the night. And me and my older sister would like huddle around him and he was like sketching. And what he was doing was like architectural sketches. And he, he told us like when he was in Vietnam, when he was a kid, when he was younger, that he always dreamt of being an architect. But when he came over to America, he felt like he couldn't pursue that because he had to find something that would provide sustenance for our family. And so I was like, is it, and you know, am I truly honoring my parents' sacrifice by picking a job that I don't think I would have loved or by following something that I really have a passion for? Is that the best way to honor it? So I, you know, turned off the key to my mission, went back to sleep and, um, I applied for film school like soon after that. Mm. Wow, that is, that's powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Bao. And also, I, I I want to call out and thank Bao because he's actually in Vietnam right now, and he is well into the the sleeping hours, and he's still joining us. And we're just so grateful that uh, you're here live because um, it's it just means a lot to hear all these different stories and to understand. You know, we see a lot of the highlights, and I think that it's a really important reminder at all times, especially honestly, the longer that we have Instagram and all of our social media platforms, I think the more that we need reminders of like, there are real challenges and tribulations behind all these successes and highlight moments. Um, and we celebrate those highlight moments, hardcore, you know, we're definitely there, but this is the true story behind how we get there, right? And I think that's what's truly inspiring. So thank you for sharing all those origin stories, everybody. And honestly, for being so transparent about these failures and these these changes, because I think that's the truth of any artist and what gives us a lot of substance to work with, honestly, when you're putting your creativity into your work. Um, and if people know the, the hero's journey, it starts, you know, you start in your ordinary world and then you start off with this call to adventure, right? You're called to something and you're entering a new world. Um, can we go around and share that part of how we started that new world? What was it like entering your chosen calling. Was it a calling too? I mean, I'm curious what y'all would call that. Um, and whoever wants to start, I would, if, if I need to call on anyone, I will. I think before we, is Lena, I think she oh. back in, is backstage. So she might have oh, been yeah. back in. Thank um, you for knowing that. Having technicals. She was having um, technical. Yeah, yeah. Marvin, How, you know, US is live, yeah. <laughs> this is live, this Video is live. live. Yeah. yeah, yeah. These are live events. 
And I'll definitely re reprompt the question once Lena's back. Um, but while we get her back on stage, Marvin, um, and we'll figure that out. Does anybody want to start with their their entering into the new world? What was it like? There she is. Yay. Yay. Hey, Sorry that. <laughs> glad you're back. Okay, so like, Lena, how do I get in? <laughs> oh, no. Okay, well, we're glad you're back. So we're going to go into the new world right now and the hero's journey. Um, how everybody crossed that threshold into the taking on this new calling of theirs, if you want to call it a calling. Um, and whoever wants to open up with their uh, with that part of their story, you may take the floor, or I'll call on someone. <laughs> <laughs> just a rant. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, because mine was not straightforward, but it was literally like one thing that did it. Um, I was uh, I was working in development at Participant Media. Um, and way back when, and then I was like, I knew I wanted to do my own thing. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make my own movie. And it was helpful that I was like naive about what goes into making a movie. Cause my mom's <laughs> like, nobody will ever give you $1 million. I'm like, you know, all these wealthy doctors <laughs> and wealthy doctors don't ever give you money. That's why wealthy South Asian doctors are wealthy. Um, and so I spent, you know, seven, eight months writing a script and then, you know, the, the year, uh, raising money for it and then you know we went to India and we had like gundas like which are like crime bosses like try to steal our money it was like a whole thing but at the end um, we premiered at the uh, and it was a great call by my executive producer we had gotten into some bigger festivals and he said you know what premiere at um, the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival he's like you're gonna have a community there that's gonna embrace you for success and he was right and and that's my first kind of window into this community and um he was right. They gave us like a huge premiere, invited all the press, all those sorts of things. And from there, right there, I got um, repped by CAA. Um, they came to the thing. After that, four months later, I was on Floor and Ulysses. And then um, meetings that they had set me up on three months after that premiere are now why like I'm executive producing a show right now. People like who I met way back when came back to me after Flora and they're like, hey, remember after Tiger Hunter and all that sort of stuff. So it was... Um, really nice to like circle back to so kind of like where it all started here. Amazing. <laughs> I mean, I love also that Tiger Hunter is like her first film because there's such tiger energy. When you speak, it's just like, yeah, we got to go do stuff. I'm going to make stuff happen. I love it. So Lena just, she went all in and she, she dealt with crime lords. Oh my God. Tiger Hunter was so good too. I, it yeah, was I, really, so I really, really, really loved that movie. I'm awesome. a, a big daddy pretty fan, so. <laughs> One of those rooms coming out in a, in a movie. It's fantastic. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Des, do you have your story? Sure. I, I guess mine was less of a hero's journey and more of a, it was a real ensemble cast kind of thing. Cause this, this is the kind of thing that I didn't step out into um, fully alone. I mean, obviously you mentioned Ronnie, you know, had, had started pursuing a creative career as well. Um, but for me, once I jumped out, cause jumping out was, I didn't spend too much time on that decision. I sort of was just like, well, I quit. <laughs> um, but then after that, there was a bit of a stage of like, ha, huh, maybe should have thought that through. Um, and I was lucky enough to have, be friends with a few uh, actors as well from Australia who have since moved out to to uh, the US and are doing doing really well in their own right too. Um, and I sort of fell in with them, and they coached me essentially. And this is sort of a thing that when I when I think about talking about community, I'm always when you seek community, it can be huge. It can be broad. It can be this massive base that supports you in this very kind of, um, not metaphorical, but like, you know, broad way. Or it can be as small as like two or three people in a room and you're doing a scene and they're just abusing the hell out of you. Like, no, you suck, like get better. Um, which was kind of where, where it started for me is I just jumped in with these guys who were career actors at that point. And um, they, they, let me sit in on their self tapes and do their um i helped them with the cameras and they're like no how about you read like and how about you put these scenes down and then how about we send these scenes out to the casting directors which you're not meant to do but we did it um but they did it they did it because they had the connections they really supported me um and it was a really kind of brutal uh journeyman's journeymanship i guess because like it was like i wasn't um you know, formally trained or anything. So they were sort of like, well, okay, what choice were you trying to make in that scene? Okay, yeah, didn't come through at all. You didn't do that, do it again, but actually make the choice. Or it was like, oh, what choice was that? Well, that's a bad choice, don't do that. You know, it was really like, um, it was pretty It was pretty honest, which was something I think when you're starting out, definitely seek 
people who are more honest than than not because that definitely helps set the initial trajectory um because at the very base level when you enter into new career you need to figure out how to become moderately competent at it and that'll get you there the fastest absolutely well said i think there's been uh, an ongoing thread of authenticity and that is present in a lot of different ways and you go through a lot to become authentic right and because you're yeah. trying to play a character or, or, or please the crowd a little bit too much, whether even that crowd is the casting director versus yourself or what your choices are. So I love that you speak yeah. on that. And that honesty is very important, especially when we're pursuing creative careers. And uh, when it speaks about honesty, Prati, I mean, we saw in that trailer, you, you have a very powerful point of view. You have a very honest voice. And I'm curious, like you, you had this self-recognition in school about, you know, the, these failures. How did you then, crossover into the HB you said that went from school to HBO right is that what happened and mm -hmm. how how did you take that leap was it something that that intimidated you or just go for it um it was just kind of more like a long shot I was you know I knew that school was not it for me by any means um and a lot you know of what Bao was talking about really really is exactly I, I know I didn't have exactly your your life, but so much of what what he was talking about in terms of you know honoring a, you know the parents' sacrifice and being somebody for them to be proud of you know that they know that they went through so much to come to this country to give you the best shot and how can you fall short of that um, that sort of thing and um, that was kind of a sort of a crippling thing that I I felt like I had to live up to their expectations which were quite narrow um, long story short not the case. Um, the expectations, I think, have been more than than exceeded upon, I think, partially by straying from what even they thought that they wanted from me. Um, so I just applied to the HBO Fellowship and I just just gave it my 100 percent all the way through. And luckily it was a diversity fellowship and like, hello. So, you know, that worked out for them <laughs> as well. Um, but the honest truth is that when I moved to L.A., um, I had like a backpack and like two thousand dollars. And so for a full year, I couch surfed. I just was essentially homeless, but like no one could have ever told you that because like I wear glasses and have like a bob. So, you know, it just seemed very sort of clean cut. I don't know if I'm straying away from the question, but that that initial shot was not one shot. That initial shot was like two years of just, just pushing, I guess. So I guess like, yeah, I think that's that's kind of the the honest the honest truth of it was seemingly f screwing up, but kind of listening to that 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 inner voice. If it's if it's loud enough, there's nothing that you're doing that seems so crazy to you, and you know that that trajectory makes sense. Respect, I love that. That actually speaks a lot to our first panel. We had a freelancers panel talking about all the gigs that folks have taken and all the different things that were not expected either of them or they expected of themselves in order to just keep pushing. And that's something that nobody else can dictate to you. So I love that you had that self-awareness and that trust in yourself. And I'm sure that that's hard earned. So we're very, we benefited from you taking those things. I like saying you're like that HBO benefit, like the world has benefited because now we have your work that we get to watch on, Mar on May 28th, just saying. Um, so uh, Bao, how about you? I mean, you shared such a beautiful story about your father and these expectations. Uh, when was applying to film school that moment, or when do you feel like you really kind of entered into that new world? Um, I mean, I still feel like I'm entering that new world in many ways, <laughs> but I think uh, I remember I, I had a sort of similar experience to Lena, where it was going and having something play at the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival about like 12 years ago, and I think. You know, for the longest time as a filmmaker, or as an artist, I was always trying to like fit into like a certain mold of like what people thought filmmakers were and like what people thought audiences were. And I think there's like such a difference between like fitting in and belonging, right? Like fitting in is when you want to be part of something and belonging is when they want you. And I think that's how I feel about those sort like things like the LA Asia Pacific Film Festival, other um, you know, Asian American festival specifically. So like quick shout out to like visual communications, right? And and all what they do for the community. Cause like that sense of belonging is so important because you don't feel like an outsider and it really empowers you, right? You 
you feel like you're part of a community, you see that you're not alone in, in the path that you've taken. I mean, there's a reason that there's a thread in all of our paths in a way, right? And that we're all sort of on this panel. And I think that's, it's, it's, it hasn't happened a lot, like until recently, I feel like these panels are like safe spaces, right? For us to really talk about experiences and, and traumas and struggles that we've all went through. And they're, again, it's so similar. and It just makes you feel not alone. And so um, I think, yeah, I, I feel like I'm finally entering this world where I feel really comfortable because there is like this, this sense of reckoning of our past and like being able to talk about all of that. Um, in a in a meaningful way, and hopefully push push things forward for you know other people who are looking to to do the same work. Absolutely, thank you for speaking on that. And shout out to Visual Communications; they're one of our community partners. We freaking love them. Um, we're so excited for all the work that they're doing and have been doing for many years. Keep supporting them. It's been a gateway for two of our panelists here, and probably for more to come. So uh, yeah, thank you to Francis and BC. I know they're watching. Shout out to Isil. She's been chiming in the chat. So I, I love you guys. Um, and Chris, I'll call you Kato. How about you, your entry? My entry, I guess my, my calling happened just because I was a 21 year old college dropout who had this crazy love for music and so I dropped out of college and my family just so happened to move to move from Virginia, um, Fairfax to Atlanta. Uh, my dad was in the restaurant business. So he had, he had gotten into the restaurant business in the Atlanta area. So they moved to Atlanta and I was this new college dropout. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to figure things out, move to Atlanta with my family. And that's really when I started, going harder with the music so i remember i would go i would go to these like open mics and showcases all over the city which there are a ton of in atlanta you know very hip-hop very music centric um hub and i would literally be the only asian person in the entire crowd and that was like every single show and open mic that i went to um but Weirdly, I never felt really out of place, you know, kind of touching on what Bao said about that, that sense of community. My community was like the hip hop community and they really embraced me, especially, you know, I feel like if you have something to offer and you're bringing something new and different and, and dope, then they embrace you. And so I felt embraced by, I never felt like an outcast or an outsider really, um, which was awesome. And eventually I met this rapper named Jaren Benton, who was, uh, an ATL native and we started working together and within a couple of years, you know, his music was picking up a lot on blogs, which was a big thing back then, like getting your music on blogs. And he got the attention of this LA based, uh, independent label called funk volume. And they flew him out to LA and next thing you know, he was signed and I was like his main producer. So, we just continued that trajectory and eventually Funk Volume offered me an in-house production contract. And that was really the start of a lot of things for me. A lot of doors opened up from that opportunity. And I was broke for a really, really long time, but uh, but it, it got better very slowly. I'm glad you stuck it out, Chris. We yeah. would not have all of your amazing music and the work and those. Those are that actually is a great transition to this next portion. And I, I apologize. I wish I had like 10 hours with all of you guys to keep talking. But you know, the hero's journey is long. So if anybody is a storyteller, y'all gotta get familiar with it. But we're we cross the threshold, you know, you meet your mentors, you you get into your trials and tribulations, your friends and your foes. Um, curious because we did have a question from the audience in the chat. Was there a time where you wanted to quit? And if we could kind of highlight a dark moment, because before y'all reach success, and this is same for everybody, and we continue to go through different versions, can you share one moment uh, when you were kind of at the low point and thinking maybe this isn't it, or maybe I just got to switch gears, or, or I'm broke, or whatever that is, and whoever wants to volunteer their their night of the dark soul, feel free. Or bearing all. 
I mean, I, I can speak to like this a specific case, like even with B water, it took five years to make. And, wow. um, you know, it's a Bruce Lee documentary. You would think people would want a Bruce Lee documentary. Right? If, if they don't want a Bruce Lee documentary, then what do they want? And <laughs> you know, two, three years into development, um, we weren't getting traction, to be honest. There were just some, you know, access issues and estate issues and and just uh, finding financing. And I wanted to quit the project for a long time. Like I was, I moved on to other projects, but my producer, Julia Nottingham, um, you know, credit's due to her because she just was like pushing me the whole time and just telling me like, you, you know, your original, um, options didn't work out but like let's pivot let's like start brainstorming other ideas and she was the one who told me like what about espn like what about 30 for 30 they were not on my list at all from the beginning and then when i thought about it i mean i love 30 for 30s the the best ones are ones that like don't take like sports as the main topic right sports is sort of a context to to move like a, a deeper story through and that's what i wanted to do with be water and i was lucky it's just like uh, I, I'm not gonna. Well, maybe I'll sound cheesy. You got to be water sometimes, right? And learn how to how to you know flow through different obstacles and and pivot. It's hard. I mean, you got to earn a living too. And I was you know directing on commercials at the time, so and it was a little um, sort of soul sucking. But I think we stuck through it. And then you know after year four of sticking through it, we got ESPN on board, and then. We got into Sundance and, you know, after Sundance, like I signed with CAA and so everything because of that moment of darkness, like just being able to pivot and, you know, Bruce Lee had the same thing. Like we all go through these moments, like he, you know, after Green Hornet and after, you know, he got rejected from Kung Fu, he pivoted and went to Hong Kong and that's how he became Bruce Lee. I think persistence is really important um, in this industry and in what you do. If you really love it, then it should be not feel like a chore you're going to constantly push yourself to to do it because you, you honestly can't do anything else sometimes right you, you you live and breathe your art in many ways very true and beautifully said i i, I just want to add i actually got my name kato from bruce lee's character in the green hornet so when i heard about be water uh I was like, yes, I have to make sure that I'm available to watch this. Um, but yeah, like, I feel like as a creative, you you reach a point of no return because you've dedicated so many hours to your craft. And were there points where I felt like I wanted to quit? Probably. But honestly, I don't even really remember those moments as much as like the the wins that came out of pushing through those moments, you know? Um, and, and like what Bao said, if it's something you love, it never feels like a, a chore or a job. It, it just, I would be doing this even if I wasn't making money off of my music. I'd still be at home, like sitting here making beats, you know what I mean? So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that. I think, I think you kind of reach a point of no return and the only way to move is forward. Just to add on to that, I definitely, oh, I'm sorry, Minji, please. But I, I definitely agree with that. Like, like the, those sort of like nights of darkness and those points of no return, I think for me, it, it wasn't like I want to quit, but it was more like, I want to keep doing this, but what is my life going to look like if I keep doing this? sort of thing where you're like, do I have to recalibrate my quality of life here? And the answer is yes. Um, because like when I was living, when I was doing the couch surfing thing, which I've always been, been pretty open about, people are like, oh my God, how did you, how did you survive that? I'm like, well, I lost 15 pounds. Like that's how I survived that. Um, like I uh, fell really sick, like truly, truly sick. Like I became, a, I did not know this, but you, you could be allergic to a virus, but I had an allergic reaction to a virus and my throat just completely closed up and like, I truly could not breathe. Um, so yeah, I was like in and out, in and out of the hospital for ages and I had to have injections and the whole nine yards and I had to go home for a month to get like a lot of physical therapy essentially to help me breathe again. And the day that I was cleared, I just went back to the couch like, because I was like, I, I don't have a choice. I, I, I can't, I can't go back now because what am I going to be a failure? No, I don't think so. 
but the other side of it was like my first, I'm not gonna name names, but there was a job that I was on. And the moment I entered, they all gave me a round of applause for being the diversity hire sort of thing. They're like, oh, the diversity is here. Wow. Yay. And like the boss was like big on massages and like there's a lot of like weird sexual innuendo, not even innuendo, full on verbal harassment thrown in my direction. And it never occurred to me to quit or to leave. I just thought like, this sucks. Maybe the next job won't be, but it was really bad. And I, and I, I don't know if that's even such a good thing. It's just more like, it's not even like living and breathing your art. It was just more like, I'm not going to go back. I refuse. So there's, I, I think that there's like, a double-edged sword there to be completely honest with you I, just off of that that's that that speaks to me because i think there really needs to be an element of like do you choose to fight this when you come up against situations like that and and i think there's a there's a line between all those stories where like we just can't quit there's no way it's like is that what kato said if we weren't doing this we'd be if we weren't getting paid to do this we'd be doing this on our couch right and like i think the thing that the only time i've ever entertained quitting and just being like, I'm done with this was uh, when I ran headfirst into some toxicity in, in that you hear about in this industry. And to this day, I don't think I can safely name the name or my career is over. But um, yeah, we, we spent a long time on a very, very abusive set. And it was horrific uh, to everyone, not just the actors, the crew, uh, everyone copped it real bad. And that was a dark time. And it was sort of like, I'm not enjoying this at all. I can't I'm waking up five minutes before my call time, which is unheard of for me. And I'm just, I cannot bring myself to go there today because it kills you artistically. Um, cruelty, fundamentally. And I think at that point, I sort of had a choice to be like, okay, it's weird because being face to face with that makes you understand how that personality forms. Um, it's sort of like, well, oh, I see. You have to become that to fight that. And for a second, I was like, okay, do I have to become an asshole? And then, I had chats with people from our community who were so uplifting and so, you know, supportive. And by definition, the AAPI community in fighting for a place at the table is against that sort of behavior. You know, there's no, it's, it is truly that street. So having chats with some people from our community, it was kind of like, no, 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 no. The way you beat this is by continuing to be kind and maybe, sure, being a little more judicious about the projects that you pick. You know, in the future, make do your due diligence. Make sure it's artistically something that you want to do. Make sure it's with people that you want to do stuff with. And again, those are two open questions that the community can provide for you. Um, very frequently, the best scripts I read are coming out from POC and marginalized communities. And the people I want to work with, the people I sit down and have coffee with and like lunches with, you know, pre-pandemic, are the people from this community. Um, it just continues to provide. So when you hit those points, and they're not necessarily something, because you, you, you're ready kind of for the instability when you enter this career. You're like, yeah, you know that's there, but you're not ready sometimes for the true bullies. And my goodness, it's horrific. Um, and when you hit those points, your community will provide if you let them. Yeah, and it's interesting because sometimes you also have to figure out like which your community you're not going to listen to. As I was, I was thinking, I was like the thing between all what everybody's saying. I feel like it was so great when I was in film school. I remember some showrunners came and they said, "For you to get anywhere in this industry, you have to fail for ten years." And I'm so grateful that they said that because it's like I expected it. So when we're saying like those things happen, there's all kinds of times where I'm like, "Like, is this going to work?" It wasn't like I'm going to quit. It's like, God, I don't have the answer. Like, how do I figure out how to get myself out of this or go forward? And that's, I think, what what is like an ingredient you have to have in this industry, like the, the figuring it out because people aren't going to pave a path. Like I have family, of course, I'm South Asian who are doctors um, and it, there's a path, right? It's like, do good on your MCAT. Go find a researcher to work with. <laughs> we don't have that path. It's like, no, you got it. And we don't have that many people from our community in the industry who can really like tell us or like, or send a rope. None of us had ropes that people could throw us. You know, they're like, hey, you know, we can introduce you to some people. We had to figure out a way to enter. And so there's always like, you have to have like this fight that you're mentioning and creativity. Like, okay, this didn't work. Like I was just starting to learn how to write, you know, my screenplay and I was getting like bad coverage the first like, several several drafts after a while i was like maybe i don't know how to do this maybe this is a bad <laughs> idea and then running out of money when you've like raised half the money but it is not easy to get the last four hundred thousand. and it's like i was like writing ehow articles all day long i was like okay 
$20 per eHow article. And that's how I can get some money to fly across the country to do those sorts of things. But it was never. And then it's like, okay, let's learn how to design a website. Like you just have to do what you got to do and then figure out how to get forward. You know, like my first, our first screening of Florin Ulysses, I did a friends and family of my own before Disney did their big one. And it did not go well. They were like, we don't like that other character. And so it's been, you know, next five months figuring out how do we fix that character so people can actually like her. So it's just that. And then what I meant about the listening community is I was remembering like the, you know, Dark Times was getting Tiger Hunter off the ground because obviously that's my first project and trying to figure out like was a lot of, you know, my local community basically, you know, going like, hey, we thought you had a future. What are you doing? What are you, like asking us for donations at our local thing. And it was a lot of like, you know, side eye and all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't, um, and it's interesting. It was not until you actually like start establishing, it probably wasn't until the Disney movie where they're like, okay, I guess, you know, you're doing something. Rather. Other than that, it was just like you know, having to willfully ignore those voices. And thankfully my parents weren't like too bad among them. They were worried, but they weren't like the stereotypical, like, oh my God, you have to be a doctor, lawyer, or whatever. But the rest of the community, a lot of them were like that. <laughs> so. Wow, that's and there's so and there's for every person. What we're hearing from so many folks is that every version, your enemy, can be yourself. It can be these bullies on set. It can be the community that you are counting on to be your biggest cheerleader, and somehow they're not. Um, there's a lot of expectations that we may have, and those get obliterated for X Y Z reason. So it's a lot in general just to have those those moments of reckoning, but. All of you have alluded to those are some of the key moments that shaped who you were as a professional and as a person to overcome that, to reach those those milestones that are like getting your traction, getting your footing, understanding like you can make a living off of this, something that you can really uh, pursue. So thank you all for being really open about these these hardships. These are not easy things to talk about, but that's honestly, I think the the substance of like what we want to learn, because a lot of folks out there feel alone in their trial. Even though they know that they're not, it still it helps to hear, especially from folks that they admire like yourselves. So um, can you all share, because we have a question from the audience from Joe about um, role models and mentors. You know, Did you have anybody, there has been mention of, we didn't have very many role models as Asian Americans in this space uh, for a variety of different reasons we can feel like we don't, but who were the people that really helped shape who you ultimately became? Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee, obviously. And now you're sitting next to the director of BYU. I know, that's crazy, Chris. right? You align. You're in, al in alignment right now. Yeah. But honestly, <laughs> when I was growing up, he was uh he was probably one of the only Asian figures that was in pop culture, you know. So for me, um, and also like, you know, my dad signed me up for uh for martial arts like when I was four years old. So I did that for about 15 years. And so that's like another reason why I looked up to Bruce Lee so much. But um yeah, he was like he was he was that figure for me. So I um I I kind of tapped into that that energy a little bit. Uh, I guess I'll go next because it's a natural transition, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I guess on a more personal level, like, yeah, it was a, it was the folks that I met, like, at the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival back in 2009, I believe. Um, you know, filmmakers that I really respected. And, and you know, I think for a long time, I put them on a pedestal. And then I realized, like, oh, they're just like us. Like, they're still, they're trying to pay the rent. And it made it made it more, you know, the proximity to, to them and their achievements was more in like, so like people like Anderson Lay and like Stefan Gauger, um, they really taught me like, this is something that's uh, manageable and accessible. And like, I remember also seeing like um, Young Chang's like up the Yangtze and having a screening with, seeing a Q and A with him. And you know, he's uh, Asian Canadian and he looks like me. And I was like, oh, there's someone who can make a film of that like quality and have the same upbringing. And I think that's so important in terms of like, you know, our conversations about, you know, quote unquote representation. It's like not just seeing um, people who look like us in terms of the storytelling, uh, like, but also behind the scenes, right? The narrative representation. We, we talk about visual representation a lot, but narrative representation, I think is equally important when we hear stories that are similar to ours, because then again, that proximity is so important. And, you know, I think, for for pe the folks in the crowd, like um, 
someone mentioned it, I think in the previous panel, like when you network, it's like, don't always try to like network so high. Like Lulu Wang like taught me, she's like network horizontally. Like don't try to like reach for a Spielberg, like find your peers and you're gonna come up with them and you're, you build that community and that sense of like um, resiliency together. And I think that's so important. Um, and so uh, just and some practical advice if like people don't respond to you right away, don't like think that's like the end of the world. And I know that so, sort of like uh, can be, um, you know, a bit disappointing sometimes, but sometimes in the world that we live in, it's hard to co correspond with everyone. So just keep trying and be persistent and, and yeah, don't take too, things too personally sometimes. Yeah, being a human person and talking to people is kind of like where my finding role <laughs> models or, or mentor thing sort of went. Cause I've never been like good at, I don't do like, oh, I, I gotta get into this room and I gotta network and this and that. I just, I like humans. Um, and then I don't know how to like do the whole poser thing. Like, oh, I'm gonna pretend I'm important or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I think you just, you know, know what the hell you're talking about and be a person and talk to people. And I found that most of the networking people many years later that I found, including my first mentor, which was just like when I was um, trying to figure out how to go about making a movie, I literally just went and just anywhere there was an occasion, like any group, anything, any like whatever, whether it was like a giant fundraiser, like we drove all the way to Las Vegas for some random like gathering, I don't know what it was for, to small groups like Film Fatales, to you know, these sorts of like everywhere. You just talk to people and meet them and you find people who are like, they might remember you later. And so my first, so like when I was raising money, uh, I met this guy who ended up, his old roommate was a guy named Alan Pow. Alan Pow, who, you know, yes, yeah, so there you go. He, he's, guy knows what he's doing and he's a he's a cool guy. He had, you know, produced a lot of movies and he took on um, Tiger Hunter as executive producer and just like told us what the hell we were doing. Like, I had no idea. He's like, this is how you actually do things. Ye who have no producer, like, <laughs> like and help me actually, like I was producing by myself at that point. He like got the proper producer on board, helped all those sorts of things. I learned so much from him. And then he introduced me to this community. And so, but, Meeting him was literally just, it wasn't like with an agenda. It wasn't, it was an agenda that I'm going to meet people, not that I'm going to work this room. Once I was in the room and I found like even the show that I said, I literally just came on board uh, a couple weeks ago was somebody I met uh, three years ago at one of these random things who later remembered me. And he heard when I was done with Florian Ulysses, he reached back out. He's like, oh, I remember having met you. Like, I'd love to work with you. And that's kind of like just how that networking went. Other people who like, like, I think when you try to force a connection with somebody and they don't want to be talking to you right now and it's not going to happen. It's, not. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay what you said, like if you know what you're talking about, you will also attract people who know what the hell they're talking about and then you tune <laughs> each other. That's yeah. been it for me. That's, that's, my, that's the beginning and end of my mentorship kind of thing. Like my mentors have all been my peers, as Bao said, and it's just, I made the, best shot at knowing what the hell I was doing. And they were like, okay, you're vaguely competent. Let's get you to like very competent. And then it was like, okay, now I'm very competent. Let's get you guys here. And then it was just sort of just, yeah, it was that, you know? I definitely get that also because I, 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 I'm sure backstage, you guys realized um, I am the worst small talker in the world. I'm like, can we just talk about like the most in-depth thing and like just go right there because if someone's like, how are you doing? I'm like, fine. Like what else do I do kind of yeah. thing. So like my luckiest thing, like how plan B was made was that um, with a peer that I would consider absolutely wonderful, Matt Lottman at uh, Herbert and Schlossberg. I, like I literally walked in there like, ha, I, I am, you know, Harold and Kumar, like, look at me. I'm, you know, come on sort of thing. And the con it was literally just a conversation that like involved me just like going on about how, you know, offensive it is that it's so hard to get birth control and you know like like legislation is so awful and it was just like literally us just quetching and shouting about how wrong and you know awful this is and like you know kill them all sort of thing like it's, it's wrong to you know to, to police women's bodies sort of thing and then like at the end of that conversation it was like oh we have a movie wow okay <laughs> like like literally that is literally what happened so I mean I think in that way like my vulnerability something that I've never been so interested in which is as lena was saying the whole like poser like look at how important i am and like gosh like quote me in this article sort of thing like i don't care for that sort of interaction and i don't care for that sort of behavior on my part or on anyone's part um having that standard and deciding to just pursue like whatever man you're either gonna dislike me or like me and hopefully you like me because i have a, an idea for a movie it just worked out like quite well i think so you know take that as it, as it comes 
I love it. That's again, I love the honesty in this room because there's no one way, like it's been said, there's no one path or formula to this. It's every, it's like learn as you go, trial and error, keep on optimizing the next one. You're going to fall flat on your face and you're going to fail forward. And I think um, y'all are great examples of that who had great persistence and you had self-awareness and you had wisdom and you'd apply that. You just put into the next thing. And that is very admirable. Um, and again, I hate that we got to wrap this up soon, but we want to get to the bright shining moment where we get to share the wins that uh have been kind of making all of this this persisting and this self-development and this artistic endeavor worth it would uh love to hear from you guys what has been a milestone that really felt like you're on top of that mountain and if you could also pair that with what is something that you want to do you know you're you're not y'all are not done you're <laughs> you're at the middle part but we've reached this per particular peak uh, what's your win and what do you, what's the next one that you want to speak into existence? Cause I'm all about that. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll go first. I'll keep it short and sweet. Falcon winter soldier is obviously a big milestone for me because personally captain America for some particular, for some weird reason meant a lot to me growing up. Um, I have a whole thing on my Twitter about it. You can go read it there, but he was a very special character for me growing up. And, uh, and just to be able to play in that corner of the universe has been really, really fun. Um, and as far as whatever the next thing goes, I mean, like, after that experience I alluded to, I'm here to have fun. I'm here to enjoy what I want to do. I want to be a space cowboy. Someone do Firefly with, like, a diverse cast and, and, and put me in there. <laughs> spoken it. It is out there, and it will be shared. Hell, yeah. <laughs> space cowboy. I love it. Anyone next? Let to speak your wins. So this is the part where people get quiet because they're like, I don't want to hype myself up. I have an unchecked ego. I don't so I have no problem. <laughs> yes, you, you, you can actually take the helm. You can call the next person. I'll go. I'll Popcorn. go. Okay. I'll volunteer. Okay. Um, I think the first big win for me was when I signed a funk volume. And I can remember when when Jaron, who is the artist that I met in Atlanta and we started working together, he got signed to Funk Volume first. So um, I can remember a very specific moment where I was like, wow, things are really about to change. He signed and he was supposed to do this like kind of live stream, kind of like what we're doing now. He was gonna do this live stream with the fans and Funk Volume itself is kind of like, it was its own kind of universe, its own world with their own fans. and. Um, they were like super fans, but I didn't know anything about it. Like I wasn't familiar with the music really, or, you know, the fans. Uh, but I can remember we were on the live stream and he was supposed to jump in and just like kind of interact and answer questions. And we get in there and then the chat just like starts blowing up. Like the questions were scrolling so fast that we couldn't even read them. So we just sat on the live stream just kind of bullshitting for like uh, for like an hour. And um, that's at that point I was like, man, this is a huge opportunity for me, you know? And a lot of doors open for from from that opportunity. I got to work with a lot of major and bigger independent artists. Uh, and I guess more recently, um, I had a song go viral on TikTok called So Pretty. And that was like a big moment for me because I was always working behind the scenes with all these artists producing all their music. And I was just like kind of the footnote, you know, like produced by Kato on the track. And TikTok was an opportunity for me to really start putting my my music and my beats out there and letting the community engage with me, you know? And that's kind of what happened and it happened in a big way. And pretty soon after that, we must have gotten reach outs from every major record label in the world. Um, they started blowing, blowing us up and reaching out via email. We got on so many Zoom calls with like the CEOs of these record labels uh, so that was a pretty cool experience. And then Tyga jumped on the remix, which was dope. And yeah, TikTok, it's kind of mind blowing. <laughs> it is. And I've been listening to you for the last year and I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My brain exploded. I thought I was like, that yeah. was crisp. Yeah. Anyway. 
Congratulations, that's awesome. We'll, we'll keep cheering you on. Chris, who, who are you choosing next to celebrate their win? Uh, let's see, Des was the only one to go. Um, I guess, uh, Lena, you go. Um, okay, I guess because it's the thing that I just came off of. Um, probably the Disney movie. Like it came out and I found out that they, um, it was it was crazy to like, it's like to work with this giant studio after being in this tiny little movie of mine. Um, and then later we looked at like, I guess they have, I didn't know that they had ratings or whatever charts or I forgot what you call them for um, streamers. And we saw that for like a few weeks, it was one of the top three streamed movies in the world. And we're like, what the hell is happening? Like, this is insane. Um, and so that was definitely kind of like one of those milestone things and which kind of led to like, you know, getting sent all this material and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, I can finally get to that point in my career where I can like this, the stories that I want to tell, you know, whether it's like whatever parts of my identity, sometimes it have to do with my community, some things that are just about, you know, from me and my personal life. And so now like next week I'm pitching like a movie, like a pet project that like means a lot to me and pitching that all, all week long to like, to like these big producers. And I'm like, this is super exciting. And I hope something happens. And it's sort of like nice to finally be able to like be in a place where like, okay, why I entered this industry can finally start creating and doing that stuff. So. Awesome. Love it. Well, we're all cheering you on. Lena, who's next? Ooh. <laughs> wow. Um, so I, I mean, for me, like B Water is still, I'm sort of riding the wave, no pun intended, um, of B Water still. Um, you know, it came out almost a year ago, but just having like the support and out, you know, overwhelming and support of the community, especially, has been um overwhelming i think you know the film came out on espn uh about a week or two after you know the brutal murder of george floyd and i had sort of trouble like talking about the film because i was doing press right after that and and um it was i was fortunate enough where the story kind of related and connected in terms of like solidarity and, and speaking out about um you know oppression and, and racism and um, I remember like once it came out, I got a lot of messages from activists, especially from Black Lives Matter. And they were telling me how, you know, during the pandemic, they haven't, you know, the pandemic was still going on and they haven't had a chance to grieve. But with George Floyd, they, were, they got very angry, uh, uh, rightfully so. But with, with Be Water, they felt like it was a moment to breathe in many ways for them to kind of just take a breath from and a break from everything that's been going on. And so I was really grateful for those messages. And obviously, you know, the, the, the messages from our community, because they felt really seen um, in, in a way and, you know, the history that I kind of planted as like a Trojan horse in the film, you know, Asian American history. Um, uh, was really important for them to see it on on like ESPN was surprising someone talking about the model minority myth on ESPN right um, and I also was touched by the, the intergenerational viewings of the film like a lot of people said you know I you know my granddad loved Bruce Lee and we never watch anything together and they watched Be Water together and like it was their first time like connecting during the pandemic and that was really heartwarming and I always thought I wanted to make like esoteric films that like only certain audiences watch, would watch. But now I was like, maybe I should make like family films. I kind of like that feeling, like having that communal uh, shared experience. And and so, yeah, th those have been great. And I, um, in terms of like what I want to do in the future, like I've been moving into the scripted space. And I think um, for me, I, I spoke about it earlier, like this idea of narrative representation, like um, Prati mentioned it too, like, you know, we have this um, assumption sometimes as the children of immigrants, like that our parents are pressuring us and that there's that obligation. And I think it's almost been created by like these stories of immigrants told by white people that, you know, our parents are strict, they're, they don't want us to do what they love, but they want, they show their love by like wanting to protect us, right? They, they're trying to protect us from the same like, um, challenges that they went through, right? They don't want us to kind of have to make that same sacrifice. I think those stories of love, familial love, aren't represented very well in, in mainstream culture. And so I'd love to tell those stories of like, you know, the different modules of love that came from our community that that haven't been sort of created um, 
and see it on the mainstream. And, and so, yeah, that's it for me. And I'll, I'll pass you. it on to the last one, not the least party. So. Yes. Um, so I think, and first of all, Val, like who, why are you making me follow you? That answer was so beautiful. My God. Um, <laughs> but I think a big win for me actually was um, the first show that I was really, like, truly fully staffed on. Um, I brought my parents over to set and like I was able to get them ice cream from the ice cream truck and you know they were able it was my episode you know they were able to sort of see my name on something and see that I wasn't like necessarily on a on a lower you know hopefully trying to get in sort of level but on equal playing field with these professionals that I so admired in this world that I so wanted to be in for so long and it was just seeing the the it wasn't even like relief on their face. It was genuinely just ecstasy and joy and happiness for me. And we were just like, just eating ice cream on the walk back home. And it was like the most blissful time ever. And it, it's not some like, it, it wasn't, I got a bunch of phone calls on my phone that I was like, I just broken in or something. It was just more like, this feels like a sustainable life. It doesn't feel like me on a couch with some, with a backpack and a cardboard box and a half a dream, you know? So I think that was like, I just like, I literally like went to the bathroom, like fully cried into my ice cream, came back out. And I was like, yeah, like, it's fine. Like, it was just like, I can't help it. I've always been very sort of emotionally vulnerable in that way. Um, so I think that was like, that was huge. That was really just something I always come back to in, in, in myself all the time. And another big win is today, like being, you know, with this peers, all these peers of people who are so positive and so lovely. I'm, I'm still discovering all of that in, in the AAPI community. And um, this is just a really lovely place to, to, to be, I'm just really happy right now. Um, and in terms of what I wanna do next, so during quarantine, my writing partner and I, and I wrote and filmed um, a web series called Bolly Weird. And it's, you know, it, it's fully shot during quarantine. So it's all piece to camera, Did not break any rules, I promise you. But I, I want to make that into a, a show. We, we got like a small audience. We got some people who, who, who enjoyed it and I acted in it. And it is, as Bao was saying, uh, that sort of immigrant experience that is not the cookie cutter one, the one where you, know, you have to betray your parents in order to find value in your life. No, like for me, I think it's walking home with your folks with some ice cream after set, that sort of feeling. But I, that, I yeah. love it. Oh, yeah. Prati, you're the perfect person to, to answer last. That's beautiful. And I just appreciate all of you so much for sharing your stories up until now, because this is, again, middle of the story. You guys have a long way ahead of you, and we're so excited. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time internationally, too, Val, uh, in the middle of the night, and just taking the time to be here, because um, these conversations, I truly believe I've, I've seen myself they are, they are watering seeds that have already been planted in us and hopefully planting more by talking to each other. Hope you all connect continuously. Um, and hope you'll stick around for the rest of the conference. If you want to jump into the, the networking, Lena, I know that's your favorite. Um, but there's so many great rooms like this that where we're going to be able to meet each other and just connect. Um, and we have more performances after this. So just really, really grateful you all took the time. And we're all cheering for you, 1,000%. I'm oh, happy yeah. to hype you up whenever you need. Track pants. 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 Track Thank you all so much. I'll talk to you again soon. Thank, Thank you all. Bye. Peace. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, guys. So. Thank you for that last panel. But well, we are not finished. And I, I thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you, everybody Everybody was tuning in for the uh, the comments and the chat. It's been wonderful. We still have one more fireside chat, and we have G. Amazawa's performance. You do not want to miss either of these. So we are a little bit over, just calling that out. Please stick around. It's just a little bit more time. But this is how live events go. We're just going to flow with it. We're going to be water. It's good. Um, so before we go into the last uh Fireside Chat, I want to do a quick shout out to our media outlets for covering our event for our conference. Um, shout out to NetShark, Broadway World, Crossings TV, Asian Journal, and Bleeding Cool. You guys are wonderful. Thank you for helping us spread the word about this event and hope you guys, you guys are tuning in. We'll share this with others because this will live on YouTube and Facebook and we want others to witness these panels, uh, even though they're not there live, but still learn and uh, experience all the inspiration that we've been sharing. 
So without further ado, let's go into our last fireside chat and then uh, have our performance from G before we close out the day and before we go into our networking event. I uh, hope you guys registered on Remo for that. This is with two incredible, wonderful fire women. Uh, we have Ruby Ibarra and Ella J. Bosco sitting down because we are talking about the future generations. We have talked about where we've been, where we're at now, and we also want to talk about where we're going. So Ruby Ibarra is an incredible Filipino-American rapper, and Ella J. Bosco is an actor. That everyone knows her from Birds of Prey. She's also a singer-songwriter, and she is you know, that emerging Gen Z face that we're going to see a lot of. She also happens to be the niece of a very famous person named Dante Bosco, who's a former collaboration board of directors member and uh, you know our beloved Rufio, and he's also uh, Zuko. So we will go into this last fireside chat. I hope you all enjoy this conversation with Ruby Barra and Ella J. Bosco. Welcome to Collaboration Empower 2021, Ruby and Ella J. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, yeah. <laughs> How are you, Ruby? I'm good as well. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us, Finji. Shout out okay. to Collaboration. Thank yes, thank you. Thank you both. This is incredible. And uh, sorry, Ella, I just like went back on my word what I just said. I was like, I'm going to call you Ella. And then I went out with Ella J. So I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's so great to talk with both of you. Ruby, you have been a frequent performer on collaboration events and we're like honored every single time you are fire you know you know how to she like burns the house down in the best way and this is such a great opportunity for us to actually talk with you and get to know your story and to know where you're at in this current craziness and ella you have we are very happily you know familiar with your family we love the boscos and it's been honestly really really great to see you rise up as this next generation performer as as an actor and now as a singer songwriter so it's honestly so great that you guys have collabed and that we're here in this moment because at empowered we really wanted to create a space for asian american stories for our narratives for our voices to count and to be mad to matter and to share that story with the aspiring creatives and you guys i don't know i just feel like i'm sitting with two queens right now so i just want to oh thank you call that out at the top so uh i introduced you just a second ago um and I wanted to get a little bit of your guys' origin stories, obviously, before we get to the collaboration element, the collaboration with the C, not the K. Um, can you guys give me your introductory? What's your elevator pitch on how would you tell people about who you are? Ruby, do you want to start? Sure, I'll, I'll kick it off. Whenever I think about my quote unquote origin story, I always trace it back to the Philippines just because a lot of my work um, you know, reflects that journey as a 1.5 generation Philippine American. Um, and that's the place that I was born. I, I grew up, or I was born in a, in a small town called Tacloban City, Philippines. And um, in the 90s, myself and my family, we migrated to the U.S. and we ended up in the Bay Area out of all places. And, you know, I'm, I'm I, when I think about that moment in my life, I'm always so grateful that it was the Bay Area out of all the places because, you know, here's this community that's not only so culturally diverse, but um, also one of the places um, in this country where, you know, hip hop is such a prominent part of the culture. And so I think, you know, these things, whether it was culturally or musically, they all ultimately affected and um, helped raise the person that I am today. And, and so, the, yeah, a lot of my work reflects on, you know, talking about where I come from and identity, because these are things that um, were a challenge to me growing up. I, I never felt Filipino enough and I also never felt American enough. And I'm sure a lot of people of color can agree, especially people that come from immigrant families and not really understanding who you are and where you come from, but also how to navigate you know, the space that you're in, especially here in the US. So up until my adulthood, I really never really embraced being Filipino or being Asian American. I think until I took uh, an Asian American studies course at UC Davis, and I think it was called Intro to Asian American History. And I remember that first semester, the the one of the assigned literature that was given to us was this novel called America's in the Heart by Carlos Bulasan. And I grew up being a bookworm. I love reading books, but for 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 some particular reason at that time, you know. I was sitting there in my dormitory and I read it cover to cover. I was unable to get up from my chair and I was just completely 
awestruck and dumbfounded by the fact that here is a piece of work that feels so familiar where the characters and the stories feel like it takes a piece out of my life and reminds me of people like my mother and my father. And so, you know, some an experience like that has been something that I've carried with me until this day. And I, I realized that, um, you know, how important representation really is and just the visibility of our stories and us feeling confident in sharing our voice. And so, um, you know, with the with the music that I do or the documentaries that I've been co-directing my friend Evelyn Obamos, um, I, I make sure to highlight, I really make sure to highlight, you know, these things, um, celebrating who I am and where I come from. And, you know, speaking of celebration, I, I'm just so happy to be in a collaboration now with Ella J and us doing a, a song and a music video like Gold, where we really get to highlight who we are. Amazing, so beautifully put. And I can tell, honestly, the level of your articulate nature, your command of words, Ruby, I mean, that, that's someone who reads, you know, like I love, you're, you're purely, your poetry, and I love that. It's an, it's even when you just talk, it's it's amazing. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Elo, how, how can we get to know you? What is your story? And you know, we've heard a lot about your uncles and, and your family and your aunts, um, but we want to know about you. What, what's going on with Ella J. Bosco? Well, I was born and raised in LA and born into a very legendary, big acting musician family. Um, I grew up, you know, I grew up doing a lot of music and um, going out on auditions and working with my family and um you know like it, i mean it's crazy growing up in a in, in the bosco family but i think just even our immediate family is um more than 20 people so it's crazy but yeah i mean growing up i i've loved playing the ukulele the guitar and the piano and music is something that i really hold near and dear to my heart um, as well as acting, because acting was my uh, first true love. But yeah, I've just been creating my whole life and um, learning new experiences and um, figuring out different things day by day as I grow up being a 14 year old right now. Oh, I, I, and oh. I'm half Korean, half Filipino. My mom is, in, my mom's like, you're half Korean, half Filipino. Just make sure you say that. I love it too. Also, I want to say we're like the perfect Venn diagram because I'm Korean, Ruby's Filipina, and like then we nice. have Ella. Yeah, it's perfect. Ella, I love you're it. you're mine and Minji's uh, kid now. Yep, yep. basically, <laughs> basically. <laughs> And I think that what's so beautifully fitting, you know, with collaboration, we just turned 20 years old. We're in our 21st year, so we're about, you know, we're like a full, full adult now. But in those 21 years, there's been such an evolution in Asian American representation in media, right? And I think that experience of seeing what it was like when we first started in 2000, you know, pre-social media, that it was a lot of the Generation X, right? And Ella, you're, are you Gen Z even? Like, are you, what is, mm -hmm. okay, you're Gen Z. Yeah, I'm Gen Z. It's wild that like, you know, that there's a complete generational shift in terms of the support that a family can give to somebody who's pursuing the arts, right? Just in terms of those cultural shifts within Asian America is really, really something to celebrate, I think, because at, at one point it felt impossible. And even though there are a lot of things that we are working through as Asian Americans still, in terms of identity, in terms of representation, I, I, I'm all about like highlighting good because I think that that's something really, really special and significant that you grew up in a creative family that it's been something welcomed in, something that you've been, you know, encouraged to flourish. And now look at you now. And you know, you're still really like you, the world's your oyster, and you're you're already doing amazing things. You're working with a legend like Ruby. I mean, that's just that's incredible to me. So I just want to say, take that moment to acknowledge that, um, Ruby. When when you guys, because I wish we had ten thousand hours to talk about all this stuff too. By the way, and I love that you're mentioning your roots and your identity. That's been so prevalent in everything that you create, from your music to the films that you're working on. How did gold come out to be? Because Ella, I took a look at your YouTube channel and I was checking out your music. I actually, I saw some of your live streams too over COVID when you were like cutting your dad's hair, I think. Oh yeah. <laughs> Highly entertaining, it's great. Um, but I'm curious about like this musical journey and how you guys came to be in this collaborative song together, the music video, everything. I would love to know the story behind this because I think it's just so timely and so powerful. Either one of you wants to share. Yeah. 
Well, um, I'm such a big fan of Ruby. I've been obsessed with her for such a long time. Um, and my aunts and uncles knew about Ruby. Um, so we went to several of her shows and it was actually when we went to the Getty, um, like we got to really personally connect. But um, yeah, we've been really wanting to collab for a while now. Um, and with the song Gold that I wrote with my brother, Daryl, um, we we really thought it was perfect that Ruby could be a part of the song. And honestly, I mean, I'm crossing it off my bucket list now that I've been able to work with the amazing and badass Ruby. Um, so yeah, I, I we just wanted to create a song that uplifted our community and really talked about, you know, dealing with identity and um, our culture identity as well. So we thought Ruby would be amazing just because her lyrics and um, what she talks about is amazing as well. So yeah, that's how Gold really came to be. Awesome. Ruby, do you want to share your side of the story? So so from my perspective, I was the fan. Actually, it was the other way around. <laughs> oh my god. So, um, <laughs> Now I can I can honestly like give Ella her flowers all day long just because she's so freaking talented and amazing. But um, it was um, at, towards the end of last year or mid last year. I remember Ella reached out via email and sent me the draft of the song, which already had her vocals and her brother co-wrote with her and produced the track. And it was just missing, I think, just the my, my verse component of it. And first and foremost, it was a no brainer for me because. Again, I'm, I'm such a fan of hers. For the folks that are tuning in right now and haven't watched Birds of Prey yet, you need to watch Birds of Prey. She absolutely killed it in that role. So badass, so fierce and ferocious. And for me, um, just to see, just seeing someone like Ella and her representation in the community and knowing that she's a role model for the next generation of you know young women of color her age and, and even younger than her. Um, for me, I was already awestruck and inspired by you know the movement that she was creating. But in addition to that, I, I remember listening to the draft of the song and hearing lyrics and also hearing how she delivered um, the, the song that she wrote with her brother. I was just completely moved. Um, I, I couldn't believe that, you know, here is a 14 year old laying down truths and complete gems on, on the track. And um, I, I again, it was also in line with a lot of the things that I've talked about in the past, um, definitely um, being confident and celebrating, um, you know, your womanhood and uh, celebrating sisterhood as well. These are all things that I've always advocated for. And I think that, you know, it, it was just a no brainer that I wanted to hop on a track with the Ella J Bosco and also at the same time, um, be part of a song that was special and had a message. Absolutely. And I think it was just this, when I, when I saw, saw slash heard the song because I, I saw the title and I saw LJ Bosco and Ruby Bar. I was like, say what? Like, excuse <laughs> me. Before I even heard anything, there was already a level of excitement because there is something very special about two powerhouses coming together and creating something. And that's the beauty of what art can do, right? And there's something very symbolic about it on top of the fact that what you're saying in it, but that collab that that partnership that like merging of forces i don't know i i'm not into the superhero universe that much but that that that's what it means to me i look at artists as superheroes because you're doing something that impacts people's hearts right and when you get to somebody's heart i think that's actually a really great access to their mind to like think differently and to look at the world differently and i think that's what you did um can we talk a little bit about the music video because i i love the song but when i saw the music video and that whole opening thing i wish you were like playing it right now um but who conceptualized it like it was just so great um do you want to talk if you i don't know i don't want to do spoilers but we can talk about it the, the soap about brown skin and um ruby i know that's been a theme in your music right there's this there's this conversation about colorism about who we are because we can't change how we look right and how we're targeted now you know i hate to bring that up but that's a truth of issues that are really being dealt with and felt on a very intense level at this moment in time or we have been how did that you know what what was the the story and the and the ideation behind that because i thought it was just so well done um and just again so timely it was really powerful well i actually and thank you for that that was amazing but um i had the idea of wanting to do some sort of period piece with the music video i thought that would be really cool trying to go back in time and um honor a specific a specific time period and I actually brought the idea 
of the music video to the director, Leslie Alejandro, who's an amazing Panay director. She, re she directed one of my other music videos, String, a couple years um, ago. But we came up with the idea of um, doing a skin whitening commercial. And she actually wrote, Leslie Alejandro, she wrote all of the, um, she wrote the whole script for that um, uh, first scene. So we, I mean, we just thought of it and we thought it was really important to kind of highlight the skin whitening industry because for such a long time, it's been such a degrading and really bad industry that's telling people to lighten their skin, to um, to be more acceptable, as accepted, to be more valued. So we wanted to highlight that in the beginning um, and lead that into gold, which is the complete opposite of that. Well done. I applaud you. And I think it's also, I think it's really great because you get to flex not only, you know, the musical part of you, but the actor part of you. So I just want to say, well done. It was, it was very, very beautifully executed. I'm a fan. And um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and to get a little bit personal, if you're both willing to talk about that, you know, because as, as women, there's a certain experience, you know, Asian American women um, that, that we have that I think has not been, I don't know, put on a public platform very often, right? There, there have been a lot of layers of silence and a lot of ignorance around it, or, you know, a lot of, a lot of words that we can describe this as, but the experience in general has kind of been shrouded in mystery. We haven't really been able to speak out on a lot of these things, which is why Ruby, I think your music has hit, like it hits my soul because it's like, you're spitting fire from like the core of my being, I just want to say. And I've heard that from other folks that hear your hey. music. It's like, they are, she is saying everything that has ever hurt that I'm proud of, like all these different feelings, right? And that's super powerful. What have your experiences been like as, you know, as a young Asian woman and as a as a growing Asian woman, like learning to deal with these identity issues with color, with how you're perceived by the world? Are you guys able to share a little bit about that? Because I feel like it's really baked into the song that you guys are celebrating who you are. Yeah, that's a very important question, Minji. Um, for me, I remember growing up as an Asian American woman, it was, it was challenging, um, you know, again, I think the, the biggest issue for me growing up was figure out, fig figuring out who the heck I was. I, I had no idea what my identity was. I think, you know, there's this unique component to it being Filipino American, having this identity that's been co colonized multiple times, um, you know, from Spain and from the US and still um, experiencing experiences the effects of imperialism to this day um, in the, back in the Philippines. And so, you know, coupled with the fact that I also migrated at a very young age and here I was in a completely new setting, um, had to kind of adapt just in order to survive. Um, it, it was it was challenging at times. Um, again, I, I didn't embrace who I was growing up. Um, I didn't really celebrate, you know, my culture. And um, it wasn't until, um, again, I was 18 years old that I finally found, or I, I have some, uh, some sort of semblance of understanding of who I was and where I came from. And honestly, it shouldn't take that long for someone to discover who they are or or to find like they're, or to feel like they're visible in, in the media that they're consuming. Um, and, and just for me, you know, seeing how, this past year unravel specifically with the rise in anti-Asian racism and hate crimes in this country, it really is very disheartening to see. Um, you know, I can't help but but think of my mother when I see these photos of people who have been attacked on the streets of San Francisco. And, um, you know, on, on that note, I also want to mention that this isn't new. Uh, this has been part of America's history, um, unfortunately. And I think that um, al although that's the case, I, I am very hopeful at the end of the day because, you know, again, we have people like Ella J, part of the, the Gen Z's who, who are understanding who they are and also celebrating it and carrying it with them and and so i'm very hopeful that the next generation is off to a good start and that they'll help continue the fight in in dismantling the systemic racism that exists in this country beautifully said ella what are your thoughts i mean yeah i've i've grown up and um i've definitely had really big um role models and influences um but Unfortunately, I didn't see myself fully reflected um, in the industry. And I'm so glad that now and more recently, we've been able to 
show our true colors and show um, that we want to be represented, um, which is why I think it's really important even in the music video, you know, we wanted to include um, our Asian American community just because the whole message behind what gold was was so important that we wanted to make sure that um, our full cast and crew was actually Asian. So it, the cast and crew was 100% Asian, um, uh, predominantly Filipino and predominantly women. So yeah, I think it's really important that we're starting to um, make sure that we are represented and make sure that we are heard because generations before us weren't able to have that opportunity. Absolutely. And sometimes I feel uh, a little guilty towards Gen Z because we're, we're putting an awful lot of pressure on them. We're like, we did X, Y, Z. Now y'all do it. We're counting on you. But pressure, no pressure, Ella. You just know that you have an amazing big sister in Ruby and you've just acquired another one. So we we have your back and it's it's all love and it's all support because what you all are doing is an extension of what came before and what Ruby and I or everybody else, you know, in our generation are extensions of what came before us. And so it's all this progression. And I think what y'all are doing through the, the mediums that you've chosen through music and through just art and, and film and, and visual creation, like it's incredibly powerful. So I want to reaffirm that in both of you, because it is it is an honor to get to talk to you about this process. We didn't even get to cover a lot of ground. Ruby, you were working, working in healthcare and like helping deal with COVID in the middle of like making art and people don't even, a lot of people continue to be awe inspired by that fact. This path is not easy in, to, in totality. You know, this, this, um, this calling that you both have is incredible. And we're both just, you know, not both, all of us, everybody watching, we're just very lucky that you guys have, have chosen to take that on and then we're cheering you on. And uh, before we wrap, which I, and I hate that we can't, we can't have more time together, but we will later time. Uh, are there any pieces of advice that you have for the Asian American creators who are watching this right now, who have their different obstacles, their different doubts, their different challenges, maybe feeling a little bit disheartened by everything that's been going on? Um, any, any parting words for them? Um, I would tell the Asian American creators, you know, that you are so supported um, in a really beautiful and talented community. And um, if if you're feeling stuck, just just continue to create and continue to write and continue to post your videos on YouTube because I know for a fact that someone will see them and someone will support you. So um, yeah, just keep creating. And if someone's not giving you an opportunity, make that opportunity for yourself, you know? Amazing, Love. I completely agree with that. I also wanna add um, to, to to always remember mm -hmm. that authenticity is key and that you know your voice is important your your experiences are unique and no one else has the same story as you and that's why what you need to share what you have to say is very important and ultimately you know what what makes us unique is what makes us beautiful and so that's again that's why i'm inspired during these times i'm seeing a rise of asian american films music literature um professors just just a growing a vast amount of representation nowadays and i can't wait you know for, to for the next generation to finally feel like our voices have become normalized i can't wait for that day where we're not talking about representation anymore because it is part of you know the history it is part of the story and ultimately that that's the truth you know we are here we've been here and we deserve to be part of the story as well Absolutely. Y'all are doing it. And thank you for what you guys have contributed to making us seen and heard. I love you both so much. And thank you for being part of our Empowered Conference, our second, hopefully final virtual conference. And hopefully we can gather in person again. I can hug both of you. But uh, yeah, thank you again for being part of our fireside chat. We're so proud of you and we're cheering for you and hope come back. Hope you come back again. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. For sure. Thank you. Hey everyone, that was a great, great way to wrap up this day. We are not completely done yet and hope you guys are registered because in a little bit, about 40 minutes, we will start our networking event and wanna kick it with you, meet you all face to face, hear what you had to say uh, about everything y'all took away from today. To close out this portion of the Empowered Creative Leadership Conference, uh, we have an amazing performance from G Yamazawa. Um, if you do not follow G yet, 
you will after this because he is absolutely incredible. He is a national poetry slam champion. He is a cultural diplomat for the Department of State. He is from Durham, North Carolina. He was part of our very first collaboration star show back in 2012 when he won collaboration DC for his spoken word poetry. And he has just bloomed and blossomed and just taken over as a rapper. Uh, he's now back out in North Carolina representing and just going hard. This is his song, Good Riddance, and I hope that you enjoy it. You're my name, G. Yamazawa. Shout out Collaboration. Shout out Empower Conference 2021. Happy Asian Month. You know what I'm saying? Um, this piece is a, it's just a little reflection. Let's get it. Yo, check it out. You should run my credit before you come for me. What's the racial demographic of your company? My face slanted mad tight. Granny got a black eye. Y'all ain't about to gaslight. Y'all better pack light. All us had a bad day. About to have a bad night. Yo, get your math right. I know that's right. Check it out. Big man cussing out the motherfucking internet. Is it doing anything? I don't really know. I Big man busting out the motherfucking pen and pad. Am I doing anything? I don't give a fuck. Shit is fuck, shit is fuck, shit is fuck. What the fuck? America, what it is, what it did and what it does. Ain't no fuss, keep it tucked, let it bust, you get touched. Who you trust, people sus, man, is hating like a virus or maybe like a drug. We blaming on some Trump shit, but I take you where I'm from. Only Asian in my grade and I was ashamed like a mom. Where they banging like a mom. Open carry state is on the hip and hanging like a mom. Times are changing, huh? Lot of waking up Sucker been all kind of racist and tired of faking it, huh, yeah I'm talking white folk and I'm talking us Some Asians act like they are not prejudiced, huh We just spent so much time trying to be patriots That's for all the times they try to take the mother out of our tongues Had some quiet fathers who didn't really know how to name their sons They were just trying to fit real quietly Don't holler shit, no politics Honestly, though, I'll admit Not all of us so confident that we could speak on all of this On some Yuri Kochiyama shit And I don't know a lot, but seem like when it comes the policy and when it come to movement yeah the women do a lot of it 2020 in june july was the first time that you bought a fist college kids start handing out no solidarity started kids who the people you bonding with to me that's really what solid is get to the bottom of problem shit i studied roots like arborist cause effect in charlotte strict a lot of shit be counterfeit high school of that drama shit that mass shooter that trauma thick so answer to what your calling is or all this shit gonna stay the same victims look just like my mama and i can't even say their names fuck sad as fuck mad as fuck had enough all i know is that we weaker as a people when we fuss A lot of folk keep their pride like a purse that they clutch We console, we consult, we combine, we get up We revive, we get up Hold it down, we get up Asian pride, we get up Black and brown, we get up Look at my eye, we get up Look at my eyes, we get up Look at my eyes Teach y'all my name G. Yamazawa Thank y'all so much for having me Happy Asian Month, all of that I hope the conference has been amazing Thank you for all the work y'all are doing And that is the end of our live stream, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for joining in. Thank you guys for sticking with us for four and a half hours through some amazing conversations. Thank you to every single panelist. Thank you to our keynote speakers. Thank you to our community partners. Thank you to our sponsors. Gotta do a quick shout out to Sony Pictures, Comcast, NBC Universal, to Warner Brothers, Hulu, Plan B. Nielsen, David Magdell and Associates, you guys made this event happen, made it free and available for the community. If you tuned in and you took anything good away from today, please share this with a friend because not everybody could join today because they had a busy Saturday. But since we are going to share this uh, on our platforms, on YouTube and on Facebook, I'm asking that everybody who tuned in today Take the link and you share it with a friend who needs some encouragement, who needs some education, who needs some inspiration. And uh, we're gonna be making change. We are already doing it. Y'all showed up today and that's what we're gonna do. And thank you so much to the team that brought Collaboration Empowered 2021 to you. Thank you to Marvin, thank you to Christine, thank you to Sung, to Juliana, to Rachel, to Megan. You guys, this was a small but mighty team, but we made this happen and we're so, so happy uh, that we could be here with you. And special shout out to Josh Ho. San Francisco for also um, supporting the effort. And yeah, this was a great conference. Hopefully next year we're in person and we'll see you at the networking event. Again, my name is Minji Chang. It was my pleasure and honor to host uh, Collaboration of Power 2021. I love you guys. Make sure to follow along on social media and we'll share more stuff with you in the near future.
Bye. Please say you'll stay. Yeah, yeah. Don't you run away just because you're afraid of something that feels out of control. We can take our time, just give it a try. Cheers.